Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What's happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. I apologize if my voice might sound a little weird throughout this recording. Uh, Mother Nature is kicking my ass uh, today. Uh, we've gone from the, what was it, like 8 to 4? 12 inches of snow dropped on us like two weeks ago to now allergies are kicking up and oh my god yes it is very bad here in upstate new york with the allergy season i am feeling the pain with you as well uh-huh. and joining us not in studio but we have to give him a happy birthday wish as well as your coach my coach the coach coach duffy happy birthday but filling the seat family of the show 607 podcast is in the building you know him from the NFL preview show. You know him from the Three Fat Nerds podcast. You know him from Horror Zone 607. You know him from 607 TWS, the wrestling show on Twitch and in podcast form too. Ladies and gentlemen of the ODPH Society, please give a warm welcome back to the show. Your friend, my friend, everybody's friend, the one and only Rich from the Three Fat Nerds podcast. Hey, what's up, ODPH Society? It's always good to be here. And, uh, you know, hey, whenever there's a lot of football to talk about, I, I seem to I seem to come in to, to make that happen. Absolutely. Everybody loves the takes you got in, especially with this wild world of free agency going on right now. And a certain team out west making a lot of moves. It's only right to bring you in for that. Cardinals. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. San Francisco Giants. Uh, <laughs> oh, are, are we talking oh, Arizona no. Coyotes? Oh, the Coyotes! Oh, Coyotes! I don't think they did. Did they do a lot of free agency this time? I, I heard that there was some uh, moves. No major moves that I saw to, to any major teams. No, hockey was a little. I mean, quiet. Your Rangers got cop. That's it. Yeah, I mean, Rangers loaded up. I mean, Blue Shirt Nation, please stand up. Uh, it is an interesting time period though because everybody's moves in the other sports are kind of just in the shadows because the NFL has taken over. But before we get into the NFL, we just want to remind you to swing on over to odphpodcast.com. Join the conversation on social media. You can find all our accounts right there. Parlay Points, new blogs are dropping this week. The T Public Store, the biggest sale of the year is going on thus far. Nice. Up, items are going to be up to 40% off from Ooh. the email I got. So Ooh. if you want to get some ODPH swag, if you want to head over to 8122productions.com and get some 3 Fed Nerds Pod swag, then you should. This is the week to do it, folks. So make sure to do that. But if you want to find out how to get there, simple. Just swing on over to odphpodcast.com, and it'll take you to where you need to go. But let's kick off this sports edition of the podcast, recapping the week that was, and what a week it was Uh in NFL free agency. Yeah. Pad? Yeah, so uh, this is going in order, and again, much like last week, it's not all of the deals. It's kind of some of the more important ones, uh, but it's in order of when they went down. And, of course, this one broke when we were recording the Entertainment Edition of the ODPH last week. And, Christ, I wish I recorded Ken's reaction during that. Uh, But it was announced that Von Miller is signing a six-year deal with the Buffalo Bills, which includes $51.5 million guaranteed. Uh, including $45 million fully guaranteed at signing. Uh, the deal is for a whopping, whopping $120 million. Yikes. Well, I will give my opinion very quickly because I want to definitely get everybody else's opinions on this as well. I am not a fan of the years and the money for a 32-year-old linebacker. but Soon, soon to be 33. It's one of the situations that with the Bills... I felt that they should have spent the money elsewhere. I know Trayman Edmonds' contract is going to be coming up. Stefan Diggs, hey, thank you, Christian Kirk, because now you just push his price through the roof. It's a very interesting time for Buffalo to make some moves, and I thought with the money they spent here, it's high risk, high reward, and a little too much for my personal liking. However, if Von Miller can produce at a high level for the next two, three years, it will be a win. It'll be worth it if we can finally get to the Super Bowl and win the thing. If it doesn't, I'm really going to have issues with this because I felt that they overpaid for him okay. at this stage in his career. I really do. I understand he's coming off the Super Bowl win, but still, if he plays the entirety of his contract, which, I mean, arguably he won't, but let's just go with it on paper, 
He's going to be 39 by the time this thing's done. I'm not cool with that, but I will warm up to it if he produces on the field because we got a short window of time with him, I feel, at this stage. Rich, your thoughts. Well, I mean, I, 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 I'm I, not a fan of the Buffalo Bills. I mean, I watched them enough. But I, I'm going to say this. One of the problems they had last year, they didn't have a good pass rush. Uh, it's one something they had to uh, address, especially because they need to get over that hump of beating the Kansas City Chiefs, like a lot of people. And I really don't have a problem with this. You have the best secondary in uh, all of football. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that was that was basically what carried you to the number one defense last year was the secondary. So now you you add in a pass rusher. Also, where you see a little bit of age, I mean, at 32, he's getting a little bit up there. But at the same point in juncture, he's also a leader. Uh, and he's won, he's been to the Super Bowl. He's won Super Bowls. I mean, this is a guy who can also lead some young guys that you're going to bring in. And I, I'm assuming the Bills will be looking at more young linebackers and defensive linemen to fill out the rest of their, their roster on, on, on their defense. So... I'm looking at the positives. Also, you know, let's be honest. There's also a salary cap Olympics that goes on each and every year. Uh, we're seeing that here in this season in particular. I think everybody's probably getting done to notice it. So this is literally a three-year deal because there's three voidable years at the end. So the money paid out, the only guaranteed money being paid is $51 million, which isn't horrible. But once again, you could void the years after three, and you know, you never know. You guys could win a Super Bowl or two, and you keep them around, and you just keep straining your guys until his contract's up. I mean, there that is that possibility. I I could see that point too. I'm just like, for me personally, it, it was not my favorable move, but I'm still gonna be cheering for him. I'm just hoping we get sooner than later because I think the window is gonna get very, very tight for them to get a real Super Bowl run out of it. Pat, I mean, it's a good deal on paper, and, and it should be good right now. But just I'm with you. That way too many years. You know, he tur- he's currently 32 years old, but uh, by the end of this week, he will turn 33 years old. So even with the potential out he has in 2025, okay, so he's 33 this year, 34 next year. Th- he'll be thir- pl- uh, be 35, about to turn 36 by the time there's that potential out if he decides to do that. Will you continue to get the same level of play from him despite the fact that he is going to be getting up there in age in terms of the of football years i don't know on paper right now it's great but i'm with you it's way too many years the dollar amount for him i understand it but for the overall needs of the team way too much money yeah it's it's gonna be something that the front office is gonna have to balance out but you know brandon bean has done a phenomenal job as gm so i trust what he's doing all the moves he's done thus far have paid off for the most part so we gotta have to wait and see but if we can get something out von miller and maybe can find some of that old Tom Brady fountain of youth magic and carry him through for a couple more seasons. It'll be well worth it. Maybe uh, another one that took place that day is uh, for Rich's Las Vegas Raiders. They gave Chandler Jones a three year deal uh, worth $52.5 million, 34 of it guaranteed. So that's $17.5 million a year. And Lord have mercy. That's a good pickup for them. Rich, your thoughts. Listen, man, I, I'm, I, this is going to be a trend. Cause we're going to come back obviously to the Raiders later on. Yes. But uh, the, the trend here. Uh, and I'll, I'll save the overview till later, but I like this move. First of all, we shored up Max Crosby before this. The one thing yes. that I, I was very happy about, we shored up Max Crosby, gave him a fat deal. And then we went out and got, and I say we, like I, I work for the damn team, but still, you know, the Raiders went out and then did something uncharacteristic, and they go get a amazing pass rusher to put on the opposite side. And I've even heard some pitching around the league that, hey, you know, what what would happen if they decide to line them up on the same side occasionally and really mess with defenses because you got to stop one of them. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot of people were kind of worried that, you know, Chandler's been in the league for a little while. Of course, I'm more excited about it because as as a lot of you guys know from this show, we grow, we are in the area where Chandler came from. Mm-hmm. He's a 607 native. Yes. So it's, 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 a, it's awesome to have him on the Raiders. Uh, I loved hearing his press conference he did when he uh, came to uh, the Raiders. He faux pawed it like I usually sometimes still do. He, he started, started to say Oakland, but then he said Las Vegas. But I, 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 gotta, I give him credit. His first reason... Uh, he said that him and his agent uh, wrote down a list of teams. The Raiders obviously were on said list. They didn't think that the Raiders were an option, uh, but it turns out they were. And the first thing that excited him was Max Crosby. He thinks that Max is the real deal. He he said he's a great pass rusher, which we got to see last season, especially towards the end of the season. Yeah. He's a monster, and he can't wait to be on the opposite end. And then, of course, the other part comes in in the new regime in Las Vegas. And uh, remember, Chandler was drafted the New England Patriots. Now his former uh, defensive line slash defensive linebacker coach is now the defensive coordinator for the Las Vegas Raiders. So it's it's all come full circle for him. 
him and he's kind of very excited. He knows, you know, he knows the GM there from the, the Patriots organization. He knows the D, you know, the D coordinator. Of course, he knows the head coach. So it, it worked out to his, you know, to bringing him in perfect fitting. He knows what's going to be expected of him. And I think that that's going to be one of those pieces, especially for leadership purposes, because you know, they're going to come in there and they're going to try to mix things up because they came from, you know, the defensive uh, philosophy will change in Las Vegas because it came from that tree of Bill Belichick. And you know, they like to mix up the, the, the signals. So I think he's going to be the perfect guy to help teach the rest of the defense. Hey, this is what we're doing going forward. It's a it's a huge win for the Raiders because now we have the uh, ru- you know rushing threat from both sides. Pat, no, it's a great it's a great pickup for the most. And Chandler's still a great player. My only concern is I know he's been injured off and on the last couple of years, so that, that's kind of the only thing with me. That like, can he stay healthy? If he can, it's going to pay out dividends for them because he's just an absolute monster on the defensive side of the balls. And so it's a great pickup for them. In my opinion, it's low risk, high reward because at this stage, Chandler, like you touched on, has had the injury bug hit him a little bit, but. If you can maximize his time on the field and especially give Max Crosby a little alleviated pressure, that is going to pay off dividends alone. It's just that factor that he is going to be on the field. And like I said, if you can get at least 50% of what we've seen out of Chandler, it's a win. I really do. I mean, I'm hoping he does well. Obviously, like Rich touched upon, he's a 607 native. So we have been rooting for him for a very long time. This is the time for the Raiders, though. They've been making some smart moves. On the defensive side, this is what you need, especially with everybody's overhyped Russell Wilson coming to the AFC West, and you know you want to put some pressure on him because you don't want to make those quarterbacks think that they're untouchable. Because that's one thing we've seen with these quarterbacks in the AFC West. Yeah, I mean, I want to add in. I mean, the week before we were all talking about how the Chargers added, you know, Joey Bosa, or well, they had Joey Bosa, but then you add <laughs> Khalil Mack. Mm-hmm. The Raiders said, oh, "Hold my beer. Yes, we're going to re-sign Max Crosby, and then we're going to add Chandler Jones." So it's kind of like almost like, hey, you know, the the two teams that fought it out for that final playoff spot are now saying, hey, we want to be the, the contenders in the AFC West. And let's be honest, I, I, you're gonna, we're going to go back to it. I think the AFC West just became the toughest division of all of football uh, in free agency as we get further into who became a free agent yeah. or who got signed this week. Fully yeah. agree. Uh, also with the Raiders, they signed cornerback Anthony uh, Everett uh, for one year as five four point five million million deals. Not too bad of a deal right there. No. Yeah, and then uh, also because I'm sure it's a smaller one, traded for uh, Yassan uh, Roxin. Uh huh. And uh, I gotta, I gotta say, for a Raiders fan, not you know, he's a good player. He's a decent hand. He's gonna be good in the in the in the backfield. But I will say this: perfect name for a Las Vegas player. Absolutely, uh-huh. you're you're in you're in uh, you are in the Sin City. It's gonna be amazing. He's gonna sell a lot of jerseys because of that. I oh, promise yeah. you that much. Facts. Uh, we know that the Buccaneers had uh, franchise tag Chris Godwin, but a deal did get worked out. He signed a three year, sixty million dollar deal with forty million fully guaranteed at signing. He's going to be a free agent again. We should note at the age of twenty nine years old. You got to you got to be honest. He made the right decision to not be upset about the franchise tag. It paid off for him with Tom Brady coming back. Yeah. So big time bucket of win for Godwin, who's now going to get to get paid on top of the fact that his patience actually really did pay off. Yeah. Yes. And no, go ahead. No, I was going to say and another thank you to Christian Kirk. His wide receivers are getting paid. <laughs> yeah. this yeah. Awesome. Everybody's yeah. getting paid. Everybody's getting Kirk. paid okay. thanks yeah. to him. Uh, next up was for the Cincinnati Bengals. They got Eli, quarterback Eli Apple back on a one-year, $4 million deal. Although, hey, thanks for that blown uh, pass coverage at the end of the game. Mm. I, I wish I could use the soundboard and just hit the, you know, bam, bam, ba man. <laughs> Come on, Eli Apple, you re-signed him? Good Lord. Yeah. yeah Times was, are rough. I was, Times are I was rough. not agreeing with that signing, but yeah. I don't make those those moves. Uh, then we got to one of the first blockbusters that took place over the last week, again, involving the Raiders. Uh, they traded with the Green Bay Packers for Pro Bowl wide receiver Devontae Adams uh, for two uh, 2022 picks. Uh, this was according to Adam Schefter. Uh, and it, it was found out that, according to Ian Rappaport of the NFL Network, uh, quote, while Aaron Rodgers was negotiating his contract, he knew Devontae Adams would never play for the Packers again. The situation was too far gone. Something had to give. And when Adams informed Green Bay he wasn't playing on the tag, talks got fired up. Now Adams will be on the Raiders. Rich, your thoughts. All right, first of all, let's talk about the Packers. I'm sorry to the Packers fans. I know we got some Packers fans who listen to this, but let's be honest. This is a big ball drop 
by the Green Bay Packer fans. Uh-huh. The Green Bay Packers front office does what it does best, and it bumbles and fumbles. And the fact that you knew going in, he didn't want – even Aaron Rodgers, when there was all the stuff about his contract, said, you, you know, he doesn't want to be franchise tag. He was on Pat McAfee's show and said, listen, nobody wants to be franchise tag, but I'm telling you, Devontae does not want the franchise tag. And sure enough, they still franchise him. And then on top of that, he gets to watch Aaron Rodgers sign this gigantic deal, and then they're just like, oh, well, you're an afterthought. Yeah. So he was already uh, heard about it. Now, once again, <laughs> let's be fair. Reports have said that the Green Bay Packers offered him more money than mm-hmm. the Raiders to stay. Working against them is you're already he's already butthurt. Let's be honest. Yeah. Uh-huh. Also, we would find out, and it wasn't had nothing to do with him going to the Raiders. He was already buying a house in Las Vegas. Yes. Which had nothing to do if he was still play for the Packers. He was still going to get still the house. Be living there. Yeah. He was this... Living next door to his college roommate and uh, really good friend Derek Carr, the quarterback for the Las Vegas Raiders. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, speaking of that, once again, Fresno State, yeah. he, him and Derek Carr, roommates, great friends. Some would say best friends. So I'm sure that that played a part. And then we would find out because he's a NorCal guy. He was a huge Raiders fan. So one of the things that he came out from him and his agents is he always wanted to be a Raider. So he got to live that dream out. Now, is some of it a big, you know, F you to the, the Packers? Oh, thousand absolutely. Percent. Uh-huh. Oh, absolutely. And for the Packers fans, and before I dive into more of the Raiders stuff, because I do want to jump in that, but for the Packers fans who are being very uh, vicious about this, guys, he's 29 years old. He is considered to be the best receiver in the NFL. He's not going to flop in Las Vegas. That's, that's some pipe dreams for you guys to make it look like, oh, we made the right choice. A lot of you were bitching about Aaron Rodgers just last season and even in the offseason. A lot of you were bitching when he was getting re-signed for a bolt ton of money that you didn't think he deserved. Don't change your story now. you know. And now, kiss your championship aspirations goodbye. Because what, is Aaron Rodgers going to throw the ball to himself? What, are you going to pick up some receivers in this really <coughs> depleted fucking draft court? Come on, guys. Like, let's be real. I'm sorry for the Packer fans who are the diehards who aren't assholes, but for those of you assholes, come on. Your team dropped the ball. Huge. Yeah. Speaking of the Raiders, though, uh, on this positive note, uh, I do believe, and I, I've ran this by Ken, and I think this is what's going on. I think with Josh McDaniels coming in, we are definitely seeing a regime change. The office is all behind McDaniels and the team that's come in. Obviously, they've given him the keys. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Mark Davis just wants to win. He believes like his father's words of just win, baby. He takes it to heart. And he says, they'll let the football guys do the football things, and we're just going to provide them with players. But the first time in as long as I can remember, we have now gone out and spent some serious money as the, as the, as the Raiders to bring in some top-tier players. We have the highest-paid wide receiver now and one of the highest-paid linebackers in the league as well. And the reason why is because that's what it takes to win football games. But more importantly, I think this is a thing where Josh McDaniels and in company are going, Derek Carr, we understand you're a leader. We understand you have a lot of heart, but there's a lot of questions. Even myself as a Raiders fan, not always comfortable with Derek Carr's quarterback. I don't think he deserves the hate that he gets online where you see the you know the meme of the soldiers behind the wall and Derek Carr's the clown. Yeah. I really don't think he, he deserves that, especially because Russell Wilson ain't done shit in years. So uh, Denver, I think, you know, if you're a Denver fan, you're really high on that Russell Wilson deal. Uh, you know, I'm I'm sorry. Dog probably would have a couple things to say about that, and because he's been a Seahawks fan having heart attacks over uh, fucking Russell Wilson's play. Facts. Uh, so don't don't get too excited yet. I'm not saying he's a bad quarterback, but don't get too excited yet. Uh, but once again, I also have questions about Derek Carr being the guy to win championships. I think Josh McDaniels and company is saying right now, hey, you're going to have a new offense. We're going to base it around you. Also, we went out. You now have the best wide receiver in the NFL. You have arguably the best tight end in the NFL. And you have the best, arguably, slot receiver in the NFL. So you have Adams, Waller, and Renfro. Yes. That's if you a murderer's row right there. And you have Josh Jacobs in the backfield. If you can't get the job done this year, and we'll, we don't go past the first round of the playoffs... We'll find somebody who can. We're going to find a new franchise quarterback. Because this, honestly, this is going to be... The, I, I guarantee you that it's a shit or get off the pot kind of year. And I'm, as a fan... I'm here for it because hopefully Derek Carr steps up to the challenge. He uses those weapons, and we have a great season out there in uh, Las Vegas. No, it's an absolutely monster deal for Devontae. He got a contract for uh, five years, 
two five million dollars. He's going to get an average of twenty eight point two five million dollars a year. Fucking monster deal. But listen, he's one of, if not the best, wide receiver in the NFL. He is worth that money. It's a great pickup for Vegas, and I agree with Rich. This is a fucking nut up or shut up moment for for Vegas, and and this is the last opportunity Derek Carr has. They've given him plenty of opportunities over the years. They've stuck with him through thick and thin. And he's really given them some good moments over the years, but not the ultimate moment they want in winning a Super Bowl. They're giving him the pieces now. Hey, listen, you've got all the pieces here to win the race. If you don't do it, we're going to find something who can. There's two ways to look at this. One, this is a huge win for the Raiders. And if anybody's saying otherwise, you're just mad because he left Green Bay. Like, this is a huge win. And you have to look at it on paper. Derek Carr, you can cue the eight-mile you have one shot (laughs) because this is it. He has no excuses for not getting the ball out to his receivers and dropping at least 28 a game, if not more. That offense is ready to go. Josh McDaniels made Tebow magic, folks. So imagine what he can do with a Derek Carr that can throw the ball downfield and is a very – prototypical NFL-style quarterback. He stays in the pocket. He's not a mobile one. McDaniels is going to make some work happen with him. If not, how hysterical would it be if he trade for Jordan Love in the offseason next year? That, that could be a thing. But, that could be a thing. But why is I say that, the second point, if you're a Packers fan, you have to really be angry, not at Devontae Adams for leaving, because I, perfe- I it makes perfect sense to me about why he sure, did. Sure, sure. You have to be mad at your front office. And this is just another example, in my opinion, of them really not reading the temp in the room. Uh huh. We had the drama about drafting Jordan Love in the first place, uh-huh. not getting Aaron Rodgers weapons, which all he's been doing for the past few years is screaming, I need weapons to go and put some points on the ball or board. If you're not giving it to him, then you go and you have that weird face-off about who's going to blink first, the GM or Rodgers, who's leaving. Then you make that your focal point this entire last season. And, I mean, you could say what you will about the vaccination status. Okay, like that's a non-factor. Yeah, yeah. This is GM versus Rodgers. Ultimately, Rodgers won. But what did you win? Because during that time period, you should have been focusing on building the rest of your team. Aaron Rodgers is a great player. Don't take anything away from him on the field. But he is not a team of one. He can't play both sides of the ball. He can't throw to himself like Rich alluded to. The fact that you have alienated your star receiver, who I'm sure would have stayed if you didn't franchise him, but you definitely put him on the back burner and said, no, he's an afterthought. We'll get to him after we deal with Rodgers. You already dealt with Rodgers for an entire season. Uh Uh-huh. You focus so much attention on him, you neglected the rest of your team. So thus, if you're forgetting about him, he's going to take his ball somewhere else. And you know, rightfully so, because he, now he's going to a situation he's comfortable in. Well, and especially you think about if, if you are in a place or working at a place where you don't like being there, you are, are looking for any excuse to get out the front door you can, and you've got a golden fucking golden fucking platter handed to you with the Raiders and all that, like that's the team you grew up watching and grew up wanting to play for. You don't think he jumped at that opportunity and will send an all-caps reply, yes? Yeah. It, it's a foolish move for the Packers to have dropped the ball yet again here. And this is a situation that if I am the ownership group, i got to really take a look at what's going on with the GM. I'm sorry to be so critical, but this is a, a body of work that has been building. This is not an overnight thing. And especially if this carries through the next season, because remember, the Packers were almost on the way to the Super Bowl this year. If this team doesn't produce for whatever reason, injuries aside, because obviously they happen in football, but if this team is still more or less cohesive and not plagued by injuries this season and they don't make a run, right? you got to start pointing some fingers somewhere. Well, you also have to remember this. I think a lot of people forget that the Las Vegas Raiders were a playoff team last exactly. year. Exactly. That is an Des- afterthought. Despite, despite all of the drama off the field, all of the things that happened, losing the coach, losing you know, your number one, uh, well, your first-round draft pick, not number one, but first-round draft pick, losing all these <coughs> things, with the exception of the fact, and, and I'm not making ex- a ton of excuses about Derek Carr, but let's be honest, he Darren Waller was injured for part of the season. Mm-hmm. Also, so your number one receiver was Hunter Renfro, which I love Hunter Renfro, but he's a slot guy. He's a guy that's a possession guy. 
receiver. Yeah, number he's two not, at best. He's, he's not going to be your number one receiver. They didn't have a clear-cut number one receiver. They still made the playoffs, and they still almost defeated a team who made it to the Super Bowl in said playoffs. We could argue all day long about the bullshit whistle. At the end yeah, of the day, yeah, yeah, yeah. at the end of the day, the Raiders still had an opportunity to punch the ball in the end zone. Should have handed the ball off to Josh Jacobs, and the, and, and that was the difference between the other coaching staff and this coaching staff. Now you bring in probably one of the best offensive masterminds in the history of, of the, the league. I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying that because he's on the Raiders. Look what he did when he was in New England. Yep. And if you're asking if he knows how to deal with the quarterback, well, there he had Tom Brady. Well, no, no, no. Let's take a step back. He also had Matt Castle. Yep. <laughs> he also had Jimmy G. So yeah. it's not like he... Jacoby Brissett for a game. Jacoby Brissett for a game. But think about it. He also had other pieces when... when uh, Brady was out, and also because he had to have game plans for them if they had to come into the game. So it's not like he doesn't understand, and as you pointed out, when he did have that short coaching staff in Denver, which you can't blame that all on him, Denver's a mess, Yeah, he still made the playoffs with Tim Tebow. Yeah, I mean, he wore, McDaniels worked some magic that year Brady was suspended the first four games of the season, because the thing a lot of people might not remember was we went to Jimmy Garoppolo got hurt, then our second backup got her. We got to our we got to our third string backup, and it was to the point where by the third or fourth game of Brady's suspension, Julian Edelman was our backup quarterback. Mm-hmm. Like it was that bad. And that was kind of funny on Twitter to to hear Julian Edelman uh, get all excited about possibly being quarterback for yeah. the New England Patriots, which you, you always have to love Julian Edelman. But like that's why you know this is a perfect storm. And once again, it is a test. This you know obviously a great signing. Because this is a five-year deal where the Raiders are going to have paid dividends with a great receiver. We haven't had... I, I'm going to go on a limb. And I'm not talking about Waller. Waller's a, f- a freak athlete who can line up at wideout. But he is still he's a, a tight end. end. But he can line up at wideout just because he's fast. Yeah. He's a he's a big target. And he's great at what he does. That's why I said he's arguably the best tight end in the league. If not, he's definitely in that conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same point in juncture, now for the first time, really... In all honesty, for the first time since probably we had Tim Brown and, and Jerry, Jerry Rice, Rice. Yeah, that era. We have a real first round. I mean, you could say Randy Moss, but let's be honest. Randy Moss yeah. wasn't at his finest when he was in Oakland. Yeah. yeah. That's, you know what I mean? So, that's yeah. honest. So, so let's be honest here. This is the first time, and this is a guy who wants to be there, and this is also a guy, thank you, Packers office, that wants to shove it up the Packers' ass. Yep. So if you don't think he's going to come out and want to catch a million passes and get a million yards and a million touchdowns, you're wrong. And Derek Carr and him have familiarity. They play together at Fresno State. They're teammates. There is a chemistry between the two of them. And they are friends, hence why they live next door to each other. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's kind of an interesting circumstance. But this is something that the Raiders have failed to do for years. As a Raiders fan, I've suffered going through off-seasons where we should have either signed our own players to big money deals that were, that were making a difference, and we just let them go. How many times have we, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, I always joke about the curse of the Raiders because mm-hmm. once you leave, usually your best years are, because let's be honest, Khalil Mack's a great player, but he went to he went to Chicago for the money, and there was no winning. Right. Uh, you know, Darren McFadden. <laughs> Enough said. Great, great player when he was on the Raiders, went to Dallas, and that was it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, like, there's, there's, there's a bunch of, like, if you go down the line, there's a bunch. I think the only successful person from the Raiders who really did well was uh, Charles Woodson. Like, when he left and then went on to do great things as far as big-name players. Yeah. And it's not because they, they weren't, because they were great when they were in Oakland slash Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. But... We first we take care of Max Crosby, very uncharacteristic. That was awesome. I was like, oh, the front office is going to sign him, and I'm like, okay, well, we're not going to do anything in the offseason. And then all of a sudden, it's a Chandler Jones, and then a few days later, get the news of Devonte Adams. I was laying on my couch, and uh, Ken sent me a message because I was I was actually playing Madden, and he's just like, yeah, yeah, congrats on Devonte Adams. I'm like, what? So I open up ESPN, and sure enough, there it is, and I'm just like, yes. This is the greatest. This is the greatest moment because it's just like I, I, it, you're like man. They really are trying to win, and uh, I like the coaching staff that's in place. I think all of those guys are talented, and uh, I think it's good. The, the Raiders, in my opinion, and it's not just because I'm a fan. I'm just looking at the list. They've had one of the best off seasons thus far, and I hope they can put it together during the season, continue winning ways, go to the playoffs, and beyond. Hard to argue with that. Uh, next up, I've got to mention quickly, the Carolina Panthers had did sign wide receiver DJ Moore to a four-year contract extension, so good for him. Also gives whoever the fuck they choose to put at quarterback somebody to throw to. Might be coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, he has been disappearing, and it is his yeah. birthday, so you never know. Maybe trying out. Uh, more puzzling uh, decision-making from the folks up in the Northwest in Seattle, where they released a defensive end Carlos Dunlap. I have no idea what they're doing in Seattle right Does now. Does Seattle know what they're doing? I, I think, I, like, I understand they want to go rebuild mode. 
No, no, no. But Pete Carroll says it's not a rebuild. (laughs) We're we're just getting rid of every veteran on our team. (laughs) You can say whatever you want, my friend. I watch what is going on. When you're dismantling Bobby Wagner, Carlos Dunlop, and Russell Wilson, you are in rebuild mode. Oh, I agree, but yeah. I'm just saying, oh, yeah, I, you've heard him. He's denying it. I Listen, you, you can say whatever you want, but I that's what I'm saying. It's Pete Carroll. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> we see what you're doing, and you don't want to fire up your fan base, but let's face it. Once you moved Russell Wilson and you started dumping all your star players, you are in a rebuild mode. And, like, however you want to see it through or, or however you want to spin it to your, your fan base, like, listen, it is what it is. Another puzzling move, but they've they're hitting the reset button. Yeah, that's all you can really say. This is just they hit the reset, and then we get to kind of the bizarre story with uh, the Cleveland Browns. Yes, <laughs> where on Thursday last week at eleven fifteen in the morning, uh, Jeff Howe uh, was reporting, "quote The Browns have been informed they're out of the Deshaun Watson trade discussions." Per source, and he's not the only one who said it. Anyway. Oh yeah, it, it was, was multiple pro- sources, multiple sources, multiple reporters said it. And it had come out that they were interested in him. So then while all that was going on, Baker Mayfield told ESPN, quote, it's in the mutual interest of both sides for us to move on. The relationship is too far gone to mend. It's in the best interests of both sides to move on, close quote. Yikes. So this got awkward real quick. You were looking at getting Deshaun Watson. Mm -hmm. You appeared you were out on that. Then your starting quarterback, Baker, who still, I believe, had a year left on his contract, said, get me the fuck out of here. My favorite part is, though, Cleveland's response was, yeah, too bad. We're not trading you. Yeah. You're going to be the starting quarterback going forward. But then we get to the better part. And then we get to <laughs> Friday where it was announced uh, that Deshaun Watson had planned to waive his no-trade clause and go to the Cleveland Browns, according to Ian Rappaport and Tom Pelissario. Uh, this was for ended up being for a fully- Guaranteed, five years, two hundred and thirty million dollars. <laughs> that is eighty million. Uh, this is from Ian Rappaport quote: "That is eighty million more than the previous record for fully guaranteed money at signing. That was one hundred and fifty million. This deal was negotiated by and then it lists his agent at, at of athletes first. Holy fucking shit! Rich, your thoughts? You are giving this much guaranteed money to a quarterback who hasn't taken a snap in two years. Uh huh." Think about this. Yep. We have not seen Deshaun Watson on a field in two years. Not to mention, this is a quarterback that you're paying guaranteed money to who is likely, not guaranteed, but likely to have to serve some sort of suspension Uh for his off-the-field antics. Yes, he's out in the court of law. Mm -hmm. Well, not the civil law, but he's not going to prison. Or maybe, who knows? <laughs> Let's give him some time in Cleveland. Uh, but still, <laughs> situation. You're guaranteed. Uh, so here's my problem. You're yes. still you're still giving him all this money when there's gigantic question marks. And even if you take the off-the-field stuff to the side, he has not taken a snap in two years. In practice? Uh-huh. But not in a game? Yeah. We don't even know if he still has the footwork. We don't know, you know, obviously he still looks in good shape because we have seen him. Yes. But, like... I don't. We don't know if he's the quarterback that was tearing up and t- comparing him to Michael Vick. We don't know if that's the case anymore. Ring rust. Yeah, you never know. And here's the other thing: it's not like these things don't deteriorate. You know, guys getting reps. Is Deshaun Watson still going to be in that category with the Lamar Jacksons of the world, with the Patrick Mahomes of the world? <laughs> that's those are the guys who are going to garner that kind of money. And you're, you're paying this to a guy who hasn't taken a snap in two years? It's insanity. And I'm not saying Baker's a great player. I'm not even saying that, like, you know, his whining was is, was worthwhile. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But at the same point in juncture, what are you thinking if you're Cleveland? This is a train wreck waiting to happen. And let's say, and I'm, I hope it's not the case, but let's say that the allegedly's that happened before happened in Cleveland. That means even if he was to go to prison, you would owe him that money. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fully guaranteed. That means they have to pay him this money. This is a completely asinine move. Like at first, I was like, "Oh, okay, this makes sense for Cleveland." You know, the, I'm sorry, the Baker experiment just isn't working. You don't know which Baker's going to show up. If you want to win, win that division, let alone the AFC conference, and win the Super Bowl, Baker wasn't it. I'm sorry. So initially, I was like, oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense. I even texted a buddy of mine who's a Cleveland Browns fan. It's like, hey, congratulations on your quarterback. The more I sat back there and thought about this, the less it made sense to me because for everything Rich said, this is a lot of fucking money. 
Like mm. this isn't like oh it's two hundred and thirty million, but only you know half of it's guaranteed. The other half, blah, blah. like no, he's getting every single dime of this, no matter what the fuck happens. And as Rich said, yes, he is you know cleared in the criminal court, but he still has twenty two or twenty three civil. Lawsuits. Yeah, they're, they're still investigating. Correct? They're still yeah, there's still twenty two well, or twenty three civil lawsuits. The civil lawsuits are still going. That's what I mean. That they're he still has to go that. to court. Well, yeah, but he still has to go to court for those. Right, and he could get sued for all this money. And from everything I've read, none of those have been settled yet. Correct. So he still is possibly on the hook for some of those. So and presumably. He is still going to be on the hook, as Rich said, for some sort of suspension from the NFL because, as was reported by uh, Jeff Darlington of ESPN yesterday on, on NFL Live, the NFL is still investigating this situation and that they've only interviewed 11 out of the 22 or 23. That's what I was referring to. I apologize yeah, yeah. for messing that up. But. Oh, yeah. He, he was, the NFL has only interviewed 11 of the 22 women that have filed civil lawsuits up against him. Mm-hmm. Now, I understand, and I and when I say I understand, I realize that the Browns came out and said, oh, we did our due diligence, we, and we're confident, you know, this won't happen again. That's a lot of fucking trust to put in a guy, given the fact that you claim you did your due diligence in investigating his background, but yet the lawyer for those women comes out and goes, they didn't call me, they haven't spoken. So how the fuck can you sit there as an owner and a GM and say, we did our due diligence, when you've got the NFL who has more power, more lawyers, and more front office staff than you have freaking sheets of paper in your building, and, and say, we're still doing our due diligence and we're still interviewing our uh, the parties involved. And you sit there and go, now nah, we did our due diligence. Now, I realize that the Browns are taking the brunt of this, but they're not the only ones at fault for this. That It was reported by multiple reporters that there were at least 12 or 13 teams interested in Deshaun Watson. Oh, yeah, they weren't the only ones. Oh, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're not the only ones, but they're the ones that threw the money. Oh, yeah, yeah. no, they, they threw the money. I, I Listen, Cleveland's got a quarterback. Whether it works out for them, I don't know. I'm not going to say good job on you because I think this is way too much risk. And not enough reward right now because, like Rick said, you don't know what you're going to get. He he hasn't played in two years. Is the skill set still there? Has anything diminished? Is he gone through a nagging injury that he just can't get through because he doesn't have the NFL medical staff there to work on him? Like, there's just too many X factors with this that I can't sit there and comfortably say, yeah, this is a good move. couple things from this. One, Baker Mayfield was not the guy that we all thought. Obviously, when he got drafted number one, he came in with the right attitude. He surprised a lot of people. But the one thing that we always stress on this show is this is a copycat league. That to be great in this league, you need to evolve with your game. Yeah. In my opinion, he never did. He was still doing the same old Baker stuff, which it works, but defenders pick up on this. Coaches pick up on this. They start picking it apart. So then when you see a quarterback like him fall off like as quickly as he did, he got exposed. Right. And when you start getting exposed, this is going to cause friction because you're not playing well. And if you're the star of the team, and let's face it, quarterbacks are, it's going to have a negative effect on your teammates. And thus, the drama has unfolded with Cleveland. And you can talk, go back through the lineage of players that he started ruffling feathers with this past couple seasons. Right. So I can understand Cleveland wanting to make a move. But then there's make a move, and then there is completely go all in on a idea. And the idea is Deshaun Watson is still the Deshaun Watson of old, that you are paying him that much money guaranteed. Now, and I will say, if they, and I don't know, if they have worked him, and if they have worked him out, I can at least stomach going, okay, they know what they're going to get. They've at least looked at it. But I haven't even read anything that they brought him in for a workout. Well, the one question you got to remember, too, with him is, for all the uncertainty, remember last year, one team was rumored to be heavily trying to get him to come to their squad, and that is the Miami Dolphins. Uh, remember? I do. Yeah. Two was supposed to be yeah. replaced. They, the yeah. Dolphins were having a love affair about trying to get him, and it didn't happen. So, obviously, he's been doing something to keep his name and his abilities fresh in GM's minds. Right. And like you touched upon, Cleveland wasn't the only team involved. Let's not forget Atlanta was yeah. ready to have him. The deal was in place. Yeah. Key to the city rumored in the whole jazz. Yeah. So they were definitely in play. Carolina had been in play 
for we a had long to, time. We had to figure Chicago would be involved. Chicago was rumored to be involved too. Seattle, you have to figure. There was a dozen teams rumored to be, all be involved, but we know about the major ones because I know Atlanta was the landing spot. Uh, Jets might have taken. I'm just because I'm looking at the teams on ESPN.com. Jets might have taken a look at them. Oh, uh, Titans, maybe, if they didn't really trust Tannehill. Uh, AFC West, LOL. Uh, <laughs> Wash- Washington, before they made the Carson Wentz deal, might have taken a look at him. Chicago obviously needs a quarterback. Detroit probably would have taken a look at him. Uh, Atlanta, obviously. Carolina, yeah. New Orleans, I guarantee, God damn oh, yeah. you. I guarantee you, before Brady came back. Every team in the NFC South. And at three team the, before Brady yeah. came back, I guarantee you they took a look at him. You, uh, and then you got the West, obviously, with Seattle and uh, the Niners, are maybe. Uh, and then the Cardinals, I doubt it. But that's the situation with him is that these teams know, knew something because for this much interest to be there, obviously he's got to be in somewhat condition to go. I don't necessarily think they knew something. Look at the people who are getting starting quarterback jobs in the NFL. Oh, that's true. Too. There's a very, it's a very anemic system this year. Uh-huh. And, and if we're going by what he was doing two years ago even, he was a phenomenal player. Once again, this is the guy who was crowned instantly of being the next Michael Vick only with an accurate arm. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, Michael Vick had a strong arm and he was great running, but we know he wasn't accurate for anything. So this is what this guy was known for. So, when you're coming into a season, and I know we're going to talk about some of these names, where guys like Marcus Mariota and Mitch Trubisky are getting starting jobs around the league. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of guys that under any normal circumstances would be a backup or going to be starting. Right. But my warning for Cleveland and fans, I hope for the Browns fans, especially if any of you are listening, I hope this works out for you. I really do. Chances are you're going to be starting Jacoby Brissett at, at quarterback for the first few games of the season because you also signed him. But my, my thing is this. As a Raiders fan, here's my warning to you. In, in in the early 2000s, we signed a number one draft pick named Jamarcus Russell. The reason there is now a rookie salary cap is because of Jamarcus Russell. Well, him and Sam Bradford. Maybe, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. But $80 million of guaranteed money on a rookie contract for somebody who didn't play. It came in looking like a linebacker mm-hmm. or a defensive lineman at 300 pounds. Shout out to that uh, playbook tape they gave him. Oh, that was the best ever. If you, have, if you haven't time. if you haven't seen that story, look up the story about Jamarcus it's Russell amazing. and the game footage. It's, a, it's amazing. It's, a it's an amazing story. But anyways, that set us back financially and as a team for for years. Like that is, and I'm not just using that as an excuse, but think about it. When you think you have your franchise quarterback at a number one pick and you've spent a ton of money, that right there. And now, mind you, this isn't a draft pick. But two hundred and fifty million dollars guaranteed, and plus they did mortgage their draft for the next three years. Yeah, yeah. So you went all in. This you is, nuked your team. Yeah, exactly. Like I say, you went all in and then some. You mortgaged your franchise for arguably the next ten years. Right. Arguably. Oh yeah. Because even if this doesn't pan out, and I don't think it will. It, I mean, it, jury is still out. As of right now, because we have to see him on the field and see what we get out of him. If we're going to get the Deshaun Watson of old, or we're going to get him in his current state and how motivated he is, and whatever the case is. Because let's face it, when you got all that guaranteed money, your motivation might get a little swayed. Because hey, guess what? You know, I don't you know any what I bet? fear of losing anything. You know what I bet? I bet we don't see him on the field at all this year. Because what's not to say he doesn't get put on the commissioner's exempt list? Well, that's the whole situation and, about and, his off-field stuff. We right. don't know yet and, what's going to be the result. And there. his off-field stuff is listen. He's a great talent, and he's got the skill set. Obviously, we don't know if it's still there, but I just cannot co-sign on it. You know, I looked it up. He's got he's still facing twenty-two civil lawsuits. I cannot look this in the face with twenty-two women. Saying he did this to me, and be like, "Yeah, no, he's fine. He's fine, Danny. I'm good on this. I just cannot sit there and stomach that." Oh, absolutely. You're right. Go, you're right, Pat. I mean, like, I, I'm sorry. This is bad on every NFL team that looked into this guy. Well, think about it. Law of averages. Like the, we, we, you know, it, this reminds me of the whole Bill Cosby stuff. It was a law of averages. Like once you have a couple people yeah. come out and say yeah. something about you, it's a couple people. It could be lies. Okay, whatever. 22. You hit, yeah. you hit a number and you go, okay, yeah. 22, the law of averages says you weren't, you weren't being smart at the very least. And I agree with you. This is a bad look at a lot of teams. But once again, that shows you how starved teams are for quarterbacks currently. That this was an th- option for some people. And obviously an option to give them guaranteed money. And if he doesn't take a snap, if the league says, oh, we're, we're, we're banning you. If the league says, it doesn't matter unless they put some in his contract. But the wording of it is fully guaranteed. Uh-huh. That means they have to pay him whether he plays or not that is the dumbest thing and that now you know why he waived 
his trade. Because going to Atlanta, I bet you they were like, okay, we'll give you this amount of money. Mm -hmm. We're not going to guarantee nothing. Right. And a lot of those other teams, and I'm not defending those teams because it was, it's a bad look either way, but I'm, I'm assuming a lot of the teams that approach were like, we'll give you a good chunk of money because you, we think you're worth it. But none of it's guaranteed because of your situation. And then here comes the Browns. Hey, man, we'll give you all the money guaranteed. Yeah. Like, and he was like, sucker, sold. And that's what it is. And, man, I, I feel bad for the Browns fans because the Browns have some diehard fans. And you They've guys just, some shit. And you, you've been through a lot. And guess what? You just got your team <laughs> nuked. Nuked. Your best case scenario is if he gets like a little four game suspension and he does well. But come on, I've already heard Cleveland Browns fans are unhappy with him there. Mm-hmm. The oh, yeah. uh, the 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 women's uh, rape and abuse shelter got the highest amount of donations from private citizens the day that he was signed. Yep, that should tell you how the local people are feeling and people across the nation. Uh, I think this is a bad look for your squad. Uh, I I I know I talked before about different teams. I think Atlanta. You could have hidden some of this because it's his hometown. And let's be honest, we, we, you know, Philadelphia, if they needed a quarterback, it would have been a perfect place. Because I remember I made the comment about, you know, Michael Vick years ago when he went to Philly after every getting out of prison and everything. I was like, listen, Philadelphia fans, as long as he's winning games, they, they'll spike puppies on the field, okay? <laughs> They're despicable. And and I made the joke earlier this season, too, and I know I talked about it last year. Yeah. The Pittsburgh Steelers would have been a home because it's not like they haven't dealt with those uh, things before from their star starting quarterback. So I'm just going to maybe not to the tune of 22 mm. <laughs> as, a you know, 20 times more. But, you know, it, it, it's still a thing. And I just I don't I don't get why you would give them that much money guaranteed with everything out there. Not to mention, let's put all that aside. We haven't seen the guy take a snap in two years. Uh-huh. Well, this whole situation in the front office, you see about a lot of the moves they have done. Yeah. And it's been like since what John Dorsey left as GM. At I mean, it's, it's just yeah. been a very weird situation. I mean, we have to give them credit there. They did get that Amari Cooper deal dropped onto their lap. I mean, yeah, yeah. like yeah. they might a fifth round pick for Amari Cooper is a pretty good deal. Uh, Even and though they, it broke they, the clocks for it twice a day. Yeah, yeah. Well, th- it was because they fell on their lap because literally it was a fucking fire sale from Dallas because they didn't have money and they had to get rid of them because they had this, the cap down. But the other thing is they also tagged uh, Njoku. Mm-hmm. So they have a great tight end. They have a great receiver. And Jacoby Brissett's going to probably be the starting quarterback. Browns are going to be having a lot of eyes on them for a lot of the wrong reasons this season. So we will have to wait and see what plays out with this whole situation. But, yeah, this is a bad PR look. And then that's why my anger for the Von Miller contract was kind of calmed down. Yeah. Because then see, there's some dumber stuff out there. Yep. I was like, you know, what? if I'm a Browns fan, I'd be, like, losing my mind right now. And I also want to point out the rumors around that uh, Carolina – and Seattle are interested in Baker Mayfield. If you are the Browns right now, you're in a rough position. Baker don't want to play for you. You could get some of your stuff back if you tr- if you trade him. That's fine. However, if I'm Baker Mayfield and they don't trade me, I'm take I'm sitting out. Yeah, I'm I, gonna be I, like I, I'm sitting out the last year. And a lot of people are saying that's a risk. I don't think it's a big risk because there's there's only a handful of good quarterbacks that'll be coming out next year. So there's going to be teams looking for a quarterback next year as well. Yeah, and plus, I mean, like you touched upon, Trubisky and Mariota are starting. Exactly. And what year is this again? 2022. Like, like, let's be honest. So if he sits out a year, oh, trust me, he could come back. Oh, yeah. I mean, that would I, be I, w- I would stick to my guns. That's exactly what I would do if I was him. Cleveland doing Cleveland things, man. This is true. Uh, switching back to the AFC West, uh, you had Juju Smith-Schuster agree to a one-year $10.75 million deal with the Kansas City Chiefs. He undersold himself. Yeah. Did you notice that? Like, number one receiver. Yeah, but, he got, but think of how... Uh, listen, people already hate that fucking team enough, oh, yeah. especially the three of us in this room. Oh, yeah. He's mm-hmm. not even making fucking TikToks with Jackson Mahomes. Ugh. Ugh. I, I, I'm going to throw this out there. Kansas City, I really only feel made this move because everybody else in the AFC West is making gigantic moves. Sure. And they had to remind people they're still there. I think that they lost a lot more. Now, I'm not saying they're a horrible team. I still, as much as I dislike the Kansas City Chiefs for obvious reasons being a Raiders fan... I will say this. They still have a very good team. You have arguably one of the best quarterbacks in the league as your quarterback. You still have the offensive weapons. On the defensive side is going to be the question with losing Honey Badger. But at the same point juncture, there we are. Yeah, I mean, it it makes sense. I mean, I think if they went back with the offense they did for the – this season it's essentially the same offense and offensive weapons they had the last couple of years so listen teams have got him pegged and got him figure out adding juju assuming he stays healthy you know adds that little dynamics to it that you know all of a sudden defensive coordinators are going well shit we can't use the same game plan we have because they're different 
Yeah, I think this move was just a lot of Kansas City trying to keep up with everybody else's moves, to be honest with you. I mean, it's Kansas City being the forgotten team in that division, just with all the moves the Raiders have done. The Broncos say what you will about Russell Wilson being Russell Wilson. You know, and obviously the Chargers are the Chargers. They're they're great on paper, but in person, you know, to be determined. Yeah, but all those teams make big moves, regardless of how well we'll see a play out. So I think that this was more of like, hey, remember us, we're still here. Yeah. So that being said, let's throw a quick break in here because there's a lot of free agent moves we still got to go into, folks. I mean, it's the NFL. They're dominating everything. So remember, hit us up on that hashtag. Hashtag ODPHpod. What is your thoughts about all of the free agents we have talked about in segment number one? Because we still got more to get in segment number two. How is your team shaping up in this offseason? Let's talk about it, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hello, everyone. My name is Nick. I'm the host of Nikolai's Kitchen, and I'm also the host of the annual live stream for The Cure. Livestream for the Cure is a charity event where we raise money with content creators and podcast partners from around the world for the Cancer Research Institute, a wonderful nonprofit researching cancer immunotherapy, training the body's immune system to fight all forms of cancer. This is a mission and a future that I truly believe in. And myself and my team worked tirelessly over the past five years to raise over $50,000 for this cause. This year, we're aiming for our biggest single goal to date of $20,000, and we cannot do it without your help. Please join us for the event May 19th through the 21st, starting at 9 a.m. Eastern for 45 hours of content from people all over the world. Together, we can bring hope for a future immune to cancer. The more eyes we reach, the more dollars we raise. Please help us in making this goal a reality. Together, we can make a difference. Coming back for some more NFL talk on this edition of the ODPH Podcast with Rich from the Three Fat Nerds Podcast in the house. Yeah. Pad. Let's keep going on the talk. Uh, Next up is the uh, Philadelphia Eagles and defensive tackle Fletcher Cox uh, agreed to terms on a one-year deal to return to the Eagles. Uh, So, hey, good for them. Yeah, I I think that's a good signing. Uh, Definitely uh, one of the guys that has been on that team and been doing some great things. So, I mean, good to give him his dues. Yeah. Solid signing. Uh, Next up is the Rams and Matthew Stafford finalized a four-year, $160 million extension with 135 of it guaranteed. Teed. Presumably, this will finish out his career uh, with him in Los Angeles and while well, in the NFL. Yo. Smart. It's a smart move, uh, especially after last year winning the Super Bowl. Um, I think he could have held out for more money. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? He's happy that he finally is a team that's actually going to protect him in the pocket while he's throwing. So, listen, good for him. I root for Stafford. Wait wait a minute. You're, so, you're telling me that uh, it is a thing to not be greedy and not take all the money and want to return a, 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 for a Super Bowl? That's crazy. It's a wild thought. Crazy talk. That's crazy talk. You might want to talk to that front office up there in Green Bay, baby. <laughs> He's going to need somebody else to throw to, though, because as we know, he does still have Cooper Cup, OBJ, free agent, I believe, but he's still got a he's he, still got his knee injury. He is a free agent, but I, I'm going to say here, I fully expect him to re-sign with the, the Rams. I can see him actually going Green Bay. But regardless, they're going to be down another uh, offensive target because the L.A. Rams traded wide receiver Robert Woods to the Tennessee Titans Good pick. Uh, for a 2023 sixth-round pick. Good for Tennessee. That's a good move for them. That's a that's a monster move for them. Big bucket of win for them. I mean, obviously Julio Jones is gone from uh, the Titans, so they they did a good job of replacing him. Uh, I, I think this is definitely a, a big one. Uh, Cooper Cup wrote a nice, like, uh, farewell letter to Robert Woods. So it looks like all it's all gravy there. Like I said, I do really expect OBJ to re-sign with the Rams because yeah. I think he wants another title, and that's the one place he's guaranteed. Although, uh, with what you said about Green Bay, Julio Jones, he might be going to Green Bay. I don't know how he's going to do in the cold, though, and he wasn't that great in Tennessee. Yeah, that's the one thing with Green Bay. It's like there's so many options for a wide receiver now since Devontae Adams went. They're like I can see OBJ and, Javar- and Jarvis Landry going there because they want to play with each other. And, and on the same team. So, like, that would make sense, too. But it, it's one of those situations that now the focus shifts to them. And it's going to be yeah. interesting to see where their market is right now. Yeah. 
Got to mention my Patriots because they're not doing much, but they've done a couple of things. Uh, they did agree to a new two-year contract with offensive tackle Trent Brown. Uh, that, according to his agent, Drew Rosenhaus, a smart pickup. He's been a great offensive tackle for us. I also know they uh, were working on a they worked on a new deal with uh, linebacker Jawan Bentley. Also a good move. He's a solid defender. Listen, they made fucking a splash last year with like a hundred and forty some odd million dollars spent in like the first twenty four hours. I was not expecting a repeat of performance this year. Yeah. I was, but I think those are both good re-signings. And uh, speaking of a place, I, that's a place that I would like to see Jarvis uh, Landry end up. I know you wouldn't like to as a Bills No, I don't fan. want to see him up there. But I think that would be a good place for him to line up because they definitely could use that number one receiver type. Uh-huh. Uh, also, uh, with the Buffalo Bills uh, losing J.D. McKissick, they did sign a veteran running back Duke Johnson to a one-year deal per his agents, Drew Rosenhaus. Ken, how are you feeling? Yeah. Like, the thing about it is this isn't like a game-changer. By any means, it's a good pickup. Though. It's a good, it's a solid pickup for him, and I know they still have got some faith in Zach Moss. Uh, we'll kind of have to wait and see about this. My question is: Has Drew Rosenhaus become the like agent for the the, the New England Patriots? Probably. Seems like Pretty everybody is, they has a sign in there. But uh, I mean, it's a good pickup once again, though. I'd like to see him. You know, I would really like to see a better running back up there in New England. Well, this is this is for Buffalo. Well, oh, oh, sorry for Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. New England, New England. Yeah, yeah. Listen, Damien Harris is good. You know, but I wouldn't hurt. You know, I know they they uh, interviewed uh, Leonard Fournette, which I was like, ooh. That yeah, he just yeah. re-upped with Tampa Bay. He re-upped with Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay but I heard that. Yeah, I, I, I heard that yesterday. I was like, ooh, Leonard Fournette. That'd be good. I'm like, listen, no disrespect to Damian Harris. He is like fucking Marshawn Lynch 2.0. You know what that run he had last year, but. Fucking Leonard Fournette comes. I'm all right with that. No, it'd be, well, unfortunately, it didn't. It'd be a good move if they could get uh, somebody like Fournette up there. I would. I'll even say that because Mac Jones, that would alleviate a lot for him. Yeah, and especially for everybody that wrote him off for dead last year. I mean, yeah. pump the brakes. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop this hockey puck in between the two of you because I mentioned it off air, but I want to mention it here. Uh-oh. There's been a rumor mill for a while that the uh, Giants might be looking to oh, move yeah. Saquon Barkley. I'm going to say both the Patriots and the Bills have some first-round picks. I, I, I'm saying if one of those teams should just happen to say, hey, we'll give you a first-round pick for Saquon Barkley, I think it would be in the best interest of both teams. I mean, typically the Patriots don't do anything with their first-round yeah. draft picks anyway, so it wouldn't be that big of a loss. I think the Patriots actually have two this year. Am I, am hey. I, am I, I think hey. I'm correct. Hey. And plus, remember who the GM is in New York now. That's true. It was Brendan Bean's uh, can, can he, can he, can protege. He, yeah. Can he, yeah, was good, can he backdoor him right up into the, the Bills? Or, but the, like, the Bills are slated to try to pick up an O-lineman in the first round. And they do need some O-line help. But I'm like, if, if I'm them, I might drop that first round pick. And people are like, oh, that's a little high. I don't know if it's a little high. Uh, for a solid running back, and this is not a running back lead, but this is a guy who still was getting yards for the New York football giants who are, uh, sorry, Giants fans, they're trash. Yeah. yeah. Like, so I'm just saying it's kind of like almost, and I'm not saying he's Barry Sanders, but remember Barry Sanders got all those yards when he played for Detroit with no line. Saquon's still finding a way to pick up some yards. And both of the teams, both of your teams respectively have good linemen. I'm just saying, throw him in there and give you guys, and he can catch passes. He's a great receiving uh, running back as well. I would take the, I would, if I'm the Bills, I would actually trade the first and Zach Moss. All right. To the Giants and try making that happen. I think that's more than fair, but like you touched on, like they don't really need that much for a first round. So if they, if they do move that pick, I'm okay with it. By the way, I don't know if the backfield's in for the the Patriots though, because I, I hear that Coach Belichick has done away with the fullback position. That well, that's, alleg- that's allegedly. I mean, allegedly, they, yeah. they allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> Damian Harris. They got the Damian Harris and Ramondre Stevenson, who both did fairly well last year. But listen, if we get the opportunity to get a Saquon Barkley or somebody like that, fucking yes, please. Oh, you, you got to take a shot with it. Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I know what I like. But I'm just saying. I think yeah. both of your teams could actually benefit if they really have him on the market. And I think one first round pick, and even if you wanted to send a player, is not so bad. And I'm sure that he would be happy. To get out of that cesspool known as New York. Yeah. yeah. I got to remember saying coach those memes as soon as he signs. <laughs> hey. Uh, next up was for the New Orleans Saints with the quarterback market ever shrinking. You know, they were they were, they were were in on Russell Wilson. They didn't get Russell Wilson. They were in on Aaron Rodgers. Mm-hmm. They, didn't, they didn't get Aaron Rodgers. They were in on Deshaun Watson, presumably. They didn't get Deshaun Watson. Uh, they probably wanted Matty Ice. They didn't get Matty Ice. Uh, so that left them with probably one only option, and that was to sign uh, Jameis Winston to a fort to a uh, two year, twenty eight million dollar deal, fourteen million dollar signing bonus, and fifteen point two million fully guaranteed. 
I, I don't actually think it's a horrible move. Uh, I, I was saying earlier I've heard the buzz around the, the league was that uh, they kind of had him on the back burner. And it kind of been like, hey, listen, we're trying to decide to Sean Watson, but if that falls through, you're our guy. I they originally at one point they had him at a million dollar contract. Yeah. So I think this is a making up for the fact that he's he he was he's been a trooper. So I think they're giving him a little extra money here just because he's been a trooper. Now, is the book completely closed on Jameis Winston? No. I don't think it is. Uh do I think that they're gonna make something happen? Who knows? With the new uh brigade down there in, in New Orleans. Maybe the athletic quarterback fits in. You got to remember they signed Hill also as a quarterback, although his contract's interesting because he makes less money if they use him in the utility role. Yeah, it's it's tricky situation. It's, he makes that. more money if he's the starting quarterback, but if he's not the starting quarterback and he's used as utility, it's less money. It's a weird deal. And <laughs> and it looks like they're not going to use him as a starting quarterback because with this money, I'm assuming Jameis Winston will be your starter for at least the next season or two. So it's going to be one of those should or get off the pot moments. Oh yeah, for Jameis Winston. Yeah, I mean it's a good it's a good pickup for New Orleans. He looked fairly good in the few games he played last year. Obviously before he went down with an injury, so it makes all the sense in the world for them to bring him back and give him another shot. But like Rich said, it's put up or shut up. Yeah, I mean this is now or never. Yeah. So not not super shocked at this one. Obviously, when Watson was taken off the board, it's like who else is going to be filling those spots? I think the only teams that would have been interested in him outside of the uh, Saints would have been Carolina and probably Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. So quite honestly, I think being on the back burner, I think he knew that too. So might as well stay there and make some money. Yep. Uh, next up was the uh, surprise move I don't think anybody saw coming, and that was the Atlanta Falcons trading former NFL MVP Matt Ryan to the Indianapolis Colts for a 2022 third-round pick. Uh, this according to Tom Pelissario, Ian Rappaport, and Mike Garofalo. Although, hey, Atlanta, good luck trying to get anything fucking done because you are now taking on $40.525 million in dead cap for 2022, uh, which is the largest in NFL history. Thankfully, the Colts have money, too, because they're also taking a $20 million hit on this deal as well. Hey. Which, so, basically, Matty Ice just walked away with, like, $60 million between yeah, the two did. teams. And he restructured the deal with the Indianapolis Colts as well. Uh, let me throw this out there. <laughs> the Colts needed a quarterback. Early on, they got rid of Carson Wentz, probably, in hindsight, probably the smartest move. Yep. They ditched him to the Commanders. Remember, the Commanders called every team in the NFL. And this is not an exaggeration. They called every team in the NFL to ask them if they wanted to trade their quarterbacks, uh, including Patrick Mahomes, including, you know, everybody. I mean, shoot your shot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't blame them. Fault them. Do not blame them. And, and you know what? The Colts, after Aaron Rodgers was taken off the board real quick, Said and Russell Wilson as well said, "Okay, well, let's move Carson Wentz. We don't, we know we don't want Carson, so let's just ditch him." And you know, they they offloaded a big hit because Carson Wentz was owned money, dead cap space. But guess what happened? The Commanders <coughs> took that dead cap space. Uh, the, the Colts coming in was weird that they didn't make more moves. They had ninety million dollars in, in in money yeah. Yeah, available. It's, it's crazy. They had the highest amount to to spend. And they didn't, and now they've spent some of it on, on, on Matt Ryan. Is that the pick for them? I don't know. They've, they've been trying to figure that shit out since 2011. Who is Atlanta? What is Atlanta? They're not smart. Neither, <laughs> yeah. Like, this move... Yeah. I mean, it's good for Matt Ryan because he gets that fucking shadow out from over him. Yeah, he, he finally gets the well-needed break from, you know, 28-3 and three that he just really is needed for how long now? Uh, since that game Oh, I mean, that's not going away. Yeah, but at least <laughs> it's, it's away enough that unless he goes by Atlanta, he won't have flashbacks because he needed to get a restart. Atlanta needed a restart. Going to the Colts, the most boring team in football, is probably the safest landing spot for him. Because you think about the quarterbacks they've had over there the past few years, they've all flown under the radar. I look at it like this. Uh, you just have to hand the ball off to Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. So, I mean, Matt, Matty Ice can't really mess that up too bad. <laughs> Can he? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Hopefully not check out of it. So, you bring up the Super Bowl and the 25-point blown lead. They're like, oh, that shadow's gone from It's not. No, the Colts fans are having a ball day. With no, us. no, it's not gone for Matty Ice. Uh, if you, I'll ask you, but if you don't remember, I'll tell you. Where was that Super Bowl played? Indianapolis. Oh, oh. no, oh, it wasn't. No. Where was it played? Houston. Who's Ooh. who's in that division? Oh, Houston. Oh, he's got. He's got. He, he's now for the next couple of years got to go play in that same deck. They're going to have twenty eight to three signs everywhere, baby. Uh huh. <laughs> Holy fucking shit! But no, I mean, listen. As I said. And, and I pose this to, uh, we got our Locks and Leaps uh, group chat. I pose this to them. I'll pose it to you, the listener. 
are the are the Indianapolis Colts the modern day Miami Dolphins? Miami Dolphins obviously had a great quarterback in uh, Dan Marino for a lot of years. Uh, didn't win a Super Bowl, but still great quarterback, top five, top ten of all time. Uh, and ever since they have not been able to fucking figure it out. Now maybe they have with Tua. Jury's still out. But now you look at the Indianapolis Colts. Had a great quarterback, obviously one of the best of all time with Peyton Manning. Won a Super Bowl. Uh, and then ever since uh, Peyton Manning left in 2011, they have had Curtis Painter, Dan Orlovsky, Kerry Collins, Andrew Luck, Matt Hasselbeck, Josh Freeman, Scott Tolson, Jacoby Brissett, Brian Hoyer, Philip Rivers, and Carson Wentz, and now Matt Ryan, all as their starting quarterbacks. No, and I'll explain why. There's one name on that list. That should have been the franchise guy. Sure. But he retired sure. at the beginning of the season. That's Andrew Luck. Yeah, that's true. So Miami has never found an Andrew Luck-esque player in the draft. I also would argue this. Also, they had some success because Phillip Rivers did take him to the playoffs. True. So they have found some <coughs> sparks. I don't want to say lightning in a bottle, but they found a couple sparks here and there. Sure. I mean, Miami, the jar has been empty in so long. I mean, there's so, so much cobwebs on it. It's not even funny. Like, you know, they're not – It's. They're an afterthought. So I would have to say in that kind of situation, yeah, it, the Colts have at least made some conscious decisions to do it. Miami has just had head-scratching moments, and quite quite a lot of them. In fact, I'd be pulling my hair out if I was a Miami fan. Thank God I'm not. <laughs> well, I will also point out about the Dolphins. They have made a couple playoff appearances since Dan Marino. I know this. But let's be honest. It wasn't because of players. It was because of when they were doing some weird wild shit, well, i.e. Yeah, the Wildcat wild or the spread offense, no huddle that they did for a little bit. That's what made them win games. And then people figured them out, and it tanked them. Also, the one year Brady blew his knee out. Yeah. Well, yeah, but once again, that also coincided with them running college uh, uh, plays that nobody saw coming in the NFL. But by the next season, when they left it in the playbook, everybody knew it was coming and knew how to shut it down. Oh yeah. It only trick plays like that only work once every until everybody has something in place. And because it's a college playbook thing, pro coaches aren't going to be like, okay, we need to defend against the wildcat. Yeah. Still though. Yeah. In the Indy, as as boring as they are, are no Miami Dolphins. Thank God. Also, they got a great offensive line and good defense. Yes. And a hell of a running back. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the best in the league. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of Atlanta, it didn't take them long to figure out who was going to be the replacement for Matt Ryan, although let's face it, he's probably a stopgap. Uh, they they agreed to terms with quarterback Marcus Mariota on a two-year deal. Sorry, Atlanta, he's not the future. He's just the bridge to get to your next guy. Uh, yeah, as a, as a Raiders fan, uh, Mariota has played for us as a backup for a couple years. Uh, you know, he came in for running plays. I haven't seen him throw a ball in a while because literally he came in just for quarterback uh, bootlegs and uh, fakes and, yeah, yeah, the read option. Yeah. He's there. Yeah. I mean, sorry. This... But they're in a rebuilding. There, there's no way you can't yeah. tell me Atlanta's in full-on rebuild at this point. No, th- Atlanta's, so been in a, smart. Atlanta's been in a rebuild. Just they've been uh, unwilling to admit it since they got blown out in the Super or they lost the Super Bowl. Yeah. Honestly, they probably should have moved Matty Ice sooner and got out. Oh, absolutely. Gotten, the, gotten that money back. Uh-huh. You know, and now and now they're doing it and they're still losing money. So they're going to be a couple years back. Uh, you know, the Falcons are pretty much going to be bottom-tier team for the next couple years. But if they're smart, they might be able to, uh, you know, turn that into a decent quarterback next year out of the draft because they presumably will have an early pick. And then we'll see where they go from there. Hey, here's a wild stat. Tom Brady is the longest tenured quarterback in that NFC South. Are we counting from uh, retirement, or are we counting from when he showed up a couple years ago? Showed up a couple years ago. Up. Okay, I just want to throw that yeah, out. Yeah, he's <laughs> the longest with, with Matty Ice leaving. He's now the longest tenured quarterback in that division. The NFL is so weird these days. Uh-huh. It's uh, so weird. I was going to say, because technically, even with the retirement, everybody else is getting a new quarterback anyways. Yeah. I mean, we could count Winston as coming back, but... He wasn't, you know, he was injured and it took him a minute to bring him back. So if we go by those stats, technically, technically. he came back, he retired and came back before any of these guys got a starting position. Yep. (laughs) I'm throwing this one in just to confuse Ken and make him go, why? Uh, The Bills agreed to a one-year deal worth up up to $4 million for wide receiver Jamison Crowder. Why? Okay, yeah, you really got my honest reaction. Why are we getting Crowder? We don't need Crowder. I mean, he's going to fill the McKenzie spot since McKenzie is going to take the Beasley one. But that's $4 million for a number four? Uh, yeah. Not weapons. my money. Weapons. I mean, I mean listen, it's, it's, listen, it's, it's, weapons. Crow, it's weapon. It's also, it's also a guy that 
hey, he's on the roster. I mean, for me in fantasy, he's never been a starter. He's been a, well, shit, I need somebody to fill in for He's a plug and play, sure. Yeah, I mean, he's going to have some moments that he could he could definitely go in there. But, I mean, I don't get the move, but, you know, okay, cool. Uh, I mean, you could have a worse fourth receiver. This is true. I mean, that, that's, that's the thing about it. I'm just kind of puzzled because, I mean, I think Gabriel Davis, unless he is not there. I... No, Gabriel Davis is there. Yeah, there. I was going to say because, like, where are you going to fit in there? Because he's like Emmanuel Sanders. Yeah, Diggs. you got Gabe. You got you got you got Diggs. You got Davis. You, you still got Sanders, I do believe, right or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We still got him. And we got McKenzie. We got McKenzie, and then you have you know once again though this is a spread wide offense. Yeah, yeah. You also added a second uh, tight end. So I mean, like a, a decent second tight end. Yeah, we got I OJ mean, Howard. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of I think they're just working up more weapons. Unfortunately, not a running back, but <laughs> working yeah. up more weapons for uh, Josh Allen because they need to get over the hump, and, and that hump is the Kansas City Chiefs. In Bean, we trust. So I, I'll go with it. Um, like I said, not my money, not my team. So like I, I, I can't really fault him. I just, I, I don't really see the need for it. I mean, if you signed him as a number one, I'd be <laughs> offended. Yeah. Well, yeah. hey, for, thanks, Christian Kirk. Yeah. Gonna get that on a T-shirt made. Yeah. Uh, and then, obviously, lastly, but certainly not leastly, we alluded to it, uh, Leonard Fournette signing a three-year, $21 million deal to return to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Hey, having Tom Brady helps. Listen, I'm telling you what happened. Bruce Arians got on that phone. The GM of that team got on the phone. They might have offered some oral pleasures <laughs> to one Thomas Brady <laughs> because they were like, listen, this quarterback stuff is not good. People are signing Marcus Mariota. People are signing these crazy uh, people like, you know, Fitzmagic is even an option these days. <laughs> Kaepernick's about to be back in the league before we all know it because we got too many garbage quarterbacks. Uh, yeah, that's basically what they did. They begged Tom Brady to come back. And once he came back, the people that didn't already lose were like, winning. Yeah, they're coming back. I mean, that's one thing. When you get a quarterback like Brady and you can say whatever he wants, being 45, it, it, until he falls off, he's still going to be Tom Brady. So uh-huh. he still will have players that want to play with him. So, I mean, this makes sense. Yeah. And, and like I say, and you touched upon, Brady coming back, everybody's coming back. It, had he left, well, Baker might be starting down there. Just saying. Could That's be. A true. Or that, that could have been a landing spot for Kaepernick. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it could have been. Like, you have to think about it with so many uncertainties still left. I mean, the two teams we got to watch now is Seattle and um, Carolina. Yeah. Because that one's still unanswered, dot, dot, dot. But in closing with this segment – We'll just go around and, okay, who's winning the free agency? I want to know your number one team that's doing it in this offseason. Well, and real quick, just before we do that, uh, in case you're curious, with Winston and Mariota coming off the board, uh, this according to Tom Pelissario, the remaining free agent quarterbacks include Cam Newton, Andy Dalton, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Geno Smith, Blaine Gavert, Trevor Simeon, Mike Glennon, Nick Mullins, Sean Ma- uh, Mannion, uh, Josh Dobbs, A.J. McCarron, Josh Rosen, and Nathan Peterman. Also, Peter, I'll, also, Peter Peterman's still around? Yeah, I was going to say. Nathan Peterman. Uh, and then also uh, Colin Kaepernick as well. Like I say, I mean, the two spots you, you can fill are Carolina and Seattle, so it's anybody's guess with that. I mean, I'm sure they'll find something. Baker's going to land on one of them, guarantee of that. And then, I well, things get dicey after that. But Rich, for, oh, I'm sorry, Pat. Uh, no, but uh, for who I think won the free agency this thus far, I, you got to say the Raiders. I mean, you just look at the moves they made on offense, the moves they made on defense. They're making a serious play for that AFC title. Uh, you know, to be a homer, I'm going to say the Raiders, but I also give credit because on the, in the same division, the Chargers were doing the same. Chargers steering up both sides of the line. So, I mean, it seems like the two teams that were the quote-unquote bottom teams in the AFC West are now <laughs> trying to make a push to be the top team in uh, playoff pushes. So, But I definitely think the Raiders, because let's be honest, Chandler Jones uh, re-signing Max Crosby, adding Chandler Jones, pass rush is phenomenal, and then you go out and you pick up Devontae Adams, and just, wow, it just blows my mind. But uh, I will say this, though, for the Packers fans out there, uh, I, I think the smart move right now is to try to move Jordan Love. Because mm-hmm. sure. if you ain't going to use him, move him, and maybe you can get some picks or whatever for him. Because you, as you just pointed out, the Seahawks and and the, the Panthers are looking for a quarterback. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be an interesting offseason with them. I have to agree with you about the Raiders. I mean, I think that they have made big adjustments on both sides of the ball. Getting Devontae Adams is a huge upgrade for him. For Derek Carr, the pressure's all on you. And he has to deliver, especially with how tough the AFC West became. And you can say what you will about Denver. I mean, just for quarterback purposes, it is now a very tough division. I mean, 
mean, Denver still had a Denver still had a, a good pickups. I mean, Denver's going to be a better team with Russell Wilson as quarterback. Mm-hmm. Who are we kidding? The FC West is going to be one of the toughest divisions in all of football. Period. Uh, I know on the preview show we'll be talking about that, which will be te- probably ten hours long. But still, yeah. uh, when we do the preview show, I, I, I you know I'm not going to change my mind it, unless something gigantic happens in another division. You're dealing with the murderer's row because the Chiefs are still the Chiefs at the end of the day. The worst team in the division, which was the Broncos, definitely got a lot better, and then the Raiders and Chargers who were on the cusp, you know, both of them, you know, one of them was a playoff team. The other one missed it by a game against the other team. Very exciting finish. Uh, are now both looking like playoff teams with just their pickups. I, I'm just going to say, if I'm looking at, if you're one of the divisions that has to go against the AFC West this year, whew, like it's going it, to, it could, literally could be a division with all winning teams uh, if they can split all of, if, if everybody splits their interdivision rivalry because you're going up against, you know, if you're the AFC East, uh, you got two good teams that are going to give up a hard fight, but that's an easy, I don't think the AFC East is playing them this year. I think it's the AFC North that is playing Believe in the West. Cause so. I know yeah. the Pittsburgh Steelers are on the Raiders schedule. The Raiders are coming to Pittsburgh Raider, and if it's early in the season. I might be going, brother. Raider, Raiders are playing the Pats. I know that. There you go. So, I, I mean, I don't know if they're playing the whole East, but it's, it's going to be one of those situations where I would not want to play the AFC West teams if I'm outside the AFC, you know, West, uh, you, if you're a team that doesn't have to line up against them, that's perfect for you. Uh, it's kind of like last year with the NFC West. You're like you just don't want to play against those teams. They're hard teams. They're gonna they're gonna win in a lot of the other matchups, and you can just only hope they beat each other up and take each other out. But yeah, big moves over there in the West. Everybody wants to come out west, I guess. Yep, and everybody's staying away from the NFC East. So that all being said, ODPH Society, hit us up on that hashtag hashtag ODPH Pod. What is your thoughts about the free agency market right now in the NFL? Who do you think still needs to be signed? Who's going where? Are you happy with your teams? Let's talk some football, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome to Talking Shiz. I am CJ. And I am Maddox. And our podcast is like a radio show. We have no certain topics. We talk about anything and everything. And our opinions don't matter. And we do have a pod page. What is our pod page where folks can find our platforms and what we're all about, Maddox? I'm glad you asked. As a matter of fact, that is podpage.com forward slash talking without a G uh, dash shiz. And that's where our it's our one stop shop. It has everything there. It has all of our donation links. It has all of the content that we have created, our recent related reviews. And it even gives you where you can find us on different applications such as Google, uh, iHeartRadio, you name it. We're in almost in every single uh, branch of applications out there. So please check it out. There's even if you want to become an official shizzler, we even have merchandise. So definitely go there, check it out, and yeah, it's literally the best one-stop shop. Absolutely, and sharing is caring, so make sure you guys share, share, share. We're on Twitter, and that's talking underscore shiz, Instagram, talking underscore shiz. We have Facebook, we got our pod page, we have different platforms, Apple Music, Spotify, what Maddox said, we are everywhere. So definitely check us out, and we definitely appreciate you guys listening. Yes, thank you guys, and we'll see you on one of our episodes. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast with Rich from 3FN in the house. Let's talk some March Madness, shall we? Holy shit, this has been crazy. This year's tournament, like we previewed, was going to be filled with surprises, a lot of parody. There is no clear-cut number one. I don't care what you're trying to say. Number one seeds are dropping here and there. Uh Uh-huh. And none bigger than Baylor taking the L. Yeah. But, Pad, you got the breakdown, so let's deep dive into the men's college basketball tournament this year. Yeah, so, I mean, just kind of some of the upsets we've had. i got to mention you had the number 12 New Mexico State Aggies uh, defeat the number 5 UConn Huskies 70-63 to in the first round. Holy shit, didn't see that one coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also had, and this is probably the biggest surprise of them all, this was in overtime, the number two Kentucky Wildcats lose to the number fifteen St. Peter's Peacocks, eighty-five to seventy-nine. What the shit? And there is a slight six oh seven connection to this. Oh, break it down. So I posted on my personal Facebook account like, "Wow, couldn't believe you know St. Peter's Peacocks you know beat Kentucky." A gentleman who graduated high school with me is their associate athletic director. Oh, hey now. So, yeah, shout out to Cameron Hardy if this somehow reaches his ears. I don't know how. Send him the link. Uh, But, (laughs) you know, he is the associate athletic director uh, at 
uh, the St. Peter's, uh, St. Peter's even made the broadcast at one point with him pumping both of his fists and chanting. Yeah. Which is probably a gift circulating online right now. I don't know, but Hey, there's a six Oh seven connection. Anytime John Calipari loses is a good day with me. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. Say, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of him. So, yeah. you know what, like I say, so I, I'm, I'm happy about this. So, yeah. you know, it is what it is. So I know Kentucky fans say it is what it is. Yeah. Like I said, he's not my favorite coach. So I, I kind of, I, I have enjoyment about this. Uh, another minor upset. You had the number 10 uh, Miami hurricanes defeat the number seven USC Trojans by the final score of 68 to 66. Boy, that was, I think a few of us had that picked. I know I had that picked in my bracket. Uh, you also had the number 11 Iowa State Cyclones defeat the number 6 LSU Tigers, 59-54. to 54. Uh, You also had another 12-5 upset. The number 12 Richmond Spiders defeat the number 5 Iowa Hawkeyes. Called that. 67-63. to 63. Richmond slows the ball down, and I think they were going to give Iowa some fits in, in that first round. So I figured they might get past there. I didn't see them going anywhere to the Sweet, area to the sweet 16, though. Sure. Uh, and then also you had the number 11 Michigan Wolverines beat the number 6 Colorado State Rams 75-63. to Had a feeling about that one, too. And, Rich, you want to kind of echo in about Michigan? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of people are happy about how they got in. That's besides <coughs> the point. They're there. I mean, this team is motivated. I mean, their coach was suspended for uh, punching somebody. But that, believe it or not, that's a good team-building moment. He was out there defending them. So, therefore, they're playing hard for their coach. And I, I think that that's the angle we're going at right now with Michigan. Uh, you know, sometimes motivation helps you quite a bit on the road. Because that's what this tournament is. It's a, it's one and done. Pretty I mean, much. it's not a tournament where, you know, a best much. out of seven, where if it was best out of seven, which it would take forever, but if it was best out of seven, a lot of these teams wouldn't beat the opponents they're going at. But that's why it's so exciting. Yeah, uh, just some of the other games you had. Uh, number one, Gonzaga beat Georgia State. Uh, number nine, Memphis beat Bo- number eight, Boise State. Uh, number four, Arkansas beat number 13, Vermont. Uh, just looking at some of the other ones. Michigan State beat Davidson in the first round. Duke. Close uh, game there, too. Uh, be, for a while until they eventually remembered, all oh, right, this is how we play. Uh, they beat uh, C.S. Fullerton, 78-61. Uh, down in the East region, you had North Carolina beat Marquette. Uh, St. Mary's beat Indiana. UCLA beat Akron. Uh, let's see, and then you got over on the southern side. Arizona beat Wright State. TCU beat Seton Hall. Illinois beat Chattanooga, Tennessee beat uh, Longwood, uh, Ohio State beat Loyola. So, hey, no Cinderella run for Loyola this year. No, the Bubba Ray Dudley gift, though, was hysterical, though, I got to admit. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that I, was good. Uh, and then in the Midwest, you had Kansas beat uh, Texas Southern, uh, Creighton beat San Diego State, Providence beat South Dakota State. Uh, you also had Wisconsin beat Colgate. Uh, and then you also had Auburn beat Jackson State. Uh, and then you had, in the second round, you had Miami shocking the world and in, in breaking Charles Barkley's heart. Because I know he, in at least one bracket, Charles Barkley had Auburn winning the whole damn thing because, surprise, he went to Auburn. Uh, so you had Auburn, number two Auburn losing to number 10 Miami. You had Iowa State beating Wisconsin and shocking them. That was an 11-3 upset. Mm-hmm. You had Providence ending Richmond's uh, Cinderella one at run at one game. Uh, so Rich Providence beat Richmond seventy nine to fifty one. Kansas uh, continued its run, beating Creighton seventy nine to seventy two. Uh, Villanova beat Ohio State to move on to the Sweet Sixteen. Michigan shocked the world and beat uh, number three Tennessee to move on to the Sweet Sixteen. You also had uh, Houston uh, beat Illinois to move on to the Sweet Sixteen, and then Arizona continue its run. Gonzaga beat Memphis to move on to the Sweet Sixteen. Uh, Arkansas and New Mexico's Cinderella run at one game to move on. Uh, Texas Tech beat Notre Dame. Uh, Duke beat Michigan State, uh, which I know Ken is very happy about. Extremely happy. that <coughs> This Duke team, like we touched upon, is a very young team. They came back from being down very late. I believe a 13-4 to run to seal the win. Yeah. So they did show some heart, and this was you know, classic Tom Izzo versus Coach K. So I love seeing this. And Duke lives on to fight another day. So is the Cinderella story going to happen? Are we going to have that Hollywood Ooh. ending? Wait and see, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and then in the East Region, and probably the wildest game of the tournament thus far, you had number one Baylor taking on number eight <laughs> North Carolina. <laughs> Some dude for Carolina fouled out or got ejected from the game. I forget what it was. Uh, Baylor was down 25 points, or 23, 25 points, something like that. It's 25. Ba- uh, Baylor came back, tied it. So North Carolina blew a fucking 25-point lead. <laughs> Stop me if you've heard that one before. 
and then it went to overtime, and then they had, they almost blew it again, but they ended up winning by the final score of 93 to 86, knocking out Baylor and knocking out a lot of people's brackets. Uh, you also had uh, number four, UCLA beat St. Mary's. Number three, Purdue beat number six, Texas. And then uh, number 15, uh, Mer- St. Peter's, continuing its Cinderella run, knocking off number seven, Murray State, 70 to 60. So your sweet 16 matchups, uh, which I'll read off your dates and times, uh, and even the uh, network, since the, the CBSSports.com is so kind enough to provide those, uh, taking place on Thursday, March 24th at 7.09 p.m. Uh, CBS. And I want to know, all of these times are subject to like games before them ending on time. Mm-hmm. So keep, the tra- keep track of your local listings. Uh, Thursday, March 24th at 7.09 p- uh, p.m. Eastern on CBS, you have number one Gonzaga taking on number four Arkansas. Uh, Thursday, March 24th at 9.39 Eastern, uh, on CBS, you have number two te- Duke taking a number three Texas Tech. So in this bracket, we can just kind of break it down. Sure. Rich, anybody jumping out at you about this one? Gonzaga and Arkansas, Texas Tech and Duke. Uh, I, I think Duke's moving on to the Elite Eight. I think Gonzaga <laughs> is also moving on, which is going to set up an uh, an awesome Elite Eight uh, matchup between Gonzaga and Duke. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go with the, the storybook uh, is going to continue on because I think Duke makes it to the Final Four. Yeah, I think that's how I, I, as Rich played it out, I think that's how I have it playing out on my bracket because that's probably about the only thing on my bracket that's still right these days. <laughs> yeah. Fucking hell. Uh, no, I think Duke's going to beat Texas Tech, and I think Gonzaga's going to uh, win their matchup against uh, Arkansas. So it'll set up for Duke and Zaga in, in the uh, Elite Eight. Uh, but I think much like Gonzaga, every tournament, they really are just never able to punch it through. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. I think it's going to go once again Duke over Gonzaga to the, get to the final four. I just think Gonzaga, as well as they're playing, and I know they're the overall number one seed. There's still so much parity; like they don't scare me in this tournament. I, I'm sorry, like, and you can say I'm a Duke homer about this. That's fine. I literally look at this Gonzaga team, and I think they're a very good team. Sure, but I think Arkansas could sneak one past them if they really play a really lights out hard defense. Duke really put it together against Michigan State. And that's one of those teams or games that, like Rich touched upon with Michigan State, and you rally around your coach. I think this team has finally put it together, and that game against Michigan State was the rallying point. Like, we need to do this for Coach K. So I think you're going to see a tougher Duke team the rest of the way here. Now, am I going to say they're going to win it? As a fan, yeah, and I still think they're going to do it as a Hollywood ending. But I think they're going to give a lot of teams, especially – the further they go, real problems. Well, that being said, when I filled out uh, one of my brackets where I did have Duke going all the way because, you know, storybook endings, uh, I looked at it and I was like, oh, Michigan State's going to be the challenge. Mm-hmm. And if they can make it past Michigan State, they're making it to the Final Four. And they made it past Michigan State, so I'm not going to uh, bank away from it now. Well, let's be honest. Gonzaga will, will probably beat Arkansas. Yeah. But Gonzaga also likes to choke when it comes to the Elite Eight or Final Four. So uh-huh. I think that they're going to come up against Duke. Duke has all the motivation in the world. Gonzaga is going to think that they are the greatest team ever because they always do. And let's be honest, on paper, they are. And in regular season college basketball, they are. But when it comes to uh, March, for some reason, they can't put it together, even though they fielded probably the best team in the tournament, arguably for the last five or six years. Uh, it's it's one of those situations where I think they're going to do it for Coach K. And on top of that, I just think, don't think that Gonzaga is going to get it done because that's what they do. They choke in March. Yeah. Uh, switching over to the other side of the bracket in the southern region, you have uh, on Thursday, March 24th at 9.59 Eastern on TBS, number one Arizona taking on number five Houston. And then on that same day at 7.29 Eastern on TBS, you have number 11 Michigan taking on number two Villanova. Love Villanova. I think they're probably playing the most solid basketball in this tournament. And I think they're going to definitely win against Michigan. I'll even say by seven. Okay. I think Michigan's going to give them a tough run. I, I do, but I think Villanova is playing at such a high level right now. And they have one of the best shooters in the country nailing shots for them. They're definitely moving the ball well. And especially in this tournament, they're playing gritty too. And that's something that they don't necessarily are known for. But Colin Gillespie, that's the guy I'm thinking of, has really been lighting it up in this tournament, so I think you're going to see more out of him. And it's going to be interesting to see how Michigan responds to him. And I think that you can definitely say, all right, what do you got? What kind of grit do you have? Is the Juwan Howard effect going to last there, or is Mich- or Villanova going to take this? And like I said, I, right. I really like Villanova in this one. And then for, you know, for the top half of the bracket, 
listen, I, I still think this is going to be Villanova's to lose, so I don't even matter about that first game. Well, I mean, Houston, Arizona, interesting. Arizona, though, has been winning gritty games. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. They, they had a nice little hot streak coming into the tournament, but they've been winning the gritty games. I mean, their last game, they won by five points. They're yeah. the round before they won by three. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Houston has uh, won by 15 the uh, in their in the uh, last round. In the round before that, they won by, I think it was like 23. Because mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I'm not going to go back that far. But Houston has been dominant. Here's the problem. Can Houston get gritty with Arizona? That's going to be the real the real uh, story in this in this matchup because they're not going to get a twenty point win over Arizona. That's yeah. just not going to happen. Arizona's defense is too good for that. So with that being said, I'm actually going to pick Arizona to beat Houston. I'm I'm with you on this. I think Michigan's magic runs out. Uh-huh. I think Villanova, who's been playing some of the best basketball period before the tournament and now into March is going to pretty, I'm not going to say roll through them. I I'm with you. It's going to be under 10 points for the win. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's going to be Villanova versus Arizona one versus two, but Villanova, they're going to the final four. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's going to take <clears throat> it, the only team that I can see upsetting them is Michigan, by the way. I do not think if they go on and if they play Houston or Arizona, they Houston or Arizona, I do not think can beat Villanova. They do not match up well with Villanova, Michigan, they play real gritty. They play real tough. Mm. If they can punch Villanova in the mouth and pull up the upset, Michigan goes on. If Michigan, go, Michigan goes on, they're going to go to the Final Four. Yeah, I could definitely see that happening. So whoever wins Villanova-Michigan is in the Final Four, Facts. in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. No, I, th- I think Arizona is going to be able to beat Houston. I think it will be close, but I think they'll ultimately be able to pull it out. And then, I listen, Jay Wright, I believe, is still coaching down there at Villanova. He's, yes, he is. He's a, he's a great coach. He's been great down there at Villanova. And no disrespect to Michigan, but hey – Clock's got to hit midnight on Cinderella at some point. It's been a great run for you, but hey, you just run it up against a really good squad. Uh, and then I think it's going to be end up being Villanova to beat Arizona to make it to the Final Four. Right on. Uh, and then switching to the bottom half of the bracket over in the Eastern region, uh, taking place Friday, March 25th at 939 Eastern. You've got number eight, North Carolina, taking on number four, UCLA. And then uh, Friday, March 25th at 7 or 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, both of these games, I should mention, are on CBS. You've got number three, Purdue, taking on the Cinderella story of number 15, St. Peter's. Oh, man, I would love to see the Cinderella story go to the Elite Eight. Honestly, I, I, and I, so I, I am just going to pick them for that reason, although Purdue is a tough team, and uh, Purdue is most likely going to win this game. If, if, you're, if you're asking me for the safe bet, if you're, mm-hmm. if you're gambling, don't pick St. Peter's. Although, if you're looking to make some good money, pick yeah. St. Peter's. Uh, I'm going to go with them because I would like to see them make it to the Elite Eight. On the other hand of the bracket, UCLA, one of the most underrated teams in this tournament. I think people forget the UCLA, now that they're healthy, has a, has a pretty good fucking squad out there. However... For whatever reason, those pesky North Carolina Tar Heels keep mushing things up. And because I am on the storybook work roll here, UNC is going to defeat UCLA. Then UNC is going to knock off St. Peter's or Purdue. I'm going to say St. Peter's because once again, I'm going with my Cinderella to set up the final four matchup between them and Duke. That's right. Number eight. UNC will play number, what is it, whether number two Duke in the Final Four rematch, one of the greatest college basketball, right? If you wrote a movie. Yeah, exactly. This is how you would write the movie. The the teams, the two teams that have been rivals forever, as a matter of fact, UNC handed Duke a loss on Coach K's last home game. Uh huh. And now we're going to be, see them in the Final Four. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to bet on anything, bet on that. Because anything short of that, by the way, <laughs> kind of disappointing. Because I, I we got to we got to make the storybook into the final four. UNC and Duke are going to meet in the final four. Uh, I think from the uh, UNC UCLA game, I think North Carolina is going to win that. And listen, I love St. Peter's, but the road's going to there uh, and there. Boiler up. I think Purdue's going to end up winning that. And then I, listen, I agree with Rich. I, UNC is a very good battle tested team. That ACC is absolutely monstrous to get through. Uh, and I think they're going to be more than ready for Purdue. So I think it'll end up being UNC to make it to the Final Four. I can't to, can't wait till we go watch this movie when it comes out. <laughs> the, the Coach K movie? The Coach K movie. Because that's how it's going to end. The dramatic loss at home in Cameron Indoor. And the team saying, we took an L here, but we won't take another one. I mean, every sports movie or every like feel-good story does inevitably have that moment where like things go south and you start to feel really bad for the for the protagonist. Mm-hmm. And like, if we are filming a movie or, or writing this movie, the last home loss of his career would be that point of the movie. Yep. So it writes itself. Carolina's taking this bracket. Like, listen, as much as I love to see St. Peter win, and like, I you know, I'm gonna I'll go on a limb. They're gonna upset Purdue. 
they're going to give that false sense of hope that they're going to be able to get there. And everybody's going to rally around them. And that's why it's going to make Carolina so much villains going into that game. <laughs> that when Carolina crushes the dreams of Cinderella and has to face the mighty Duke Blue Devils in the Final Four. If we're writing this movie, though, UNC's got to beat like St. Peter's by like double digits. Yeah, it got to beat like by 20, 40. 25, 30. 40. Just, Bill, just, Bel- Bill Belichick rules. Yeah, just keep running the score. Run them out the gym. It'll be like the original dream team in the Olympics. They'll be dropping about 45 on them. Oh, but then but then, what are we writing here for the sports movie? Are we writing a uh, the, the love story, the happy ending? Or are we writing a horror film where UNC comes out and dominates Duke to go to the finals? It'll be like a triple overtime. It'll be like when Syracuse <laughs> took on Connecticut there. No, that was six. Or six, yeah. It'll be something like that. That's how it's going to end. It'll be, it's going to be the fight forever. Like I say, we we probably watch way too much wrestling, but this is how it's going down. I'm telling you right now, Carolina's taking this bracket. Uh, and then the last region we've got is the Midwest region where uh, taking place Friday, March 25th, 7.29 p.m. Eastern on TBS. You have number one Kansas taking on number four Providence. And then Friday, March 25th, 9.59 Eastern on TBS, number 11 Iowa State taking on number 10, the U, Miami. Well, you know, every year Kansas comes in and does things. Let's be honest. Kansas mm-hmm. is one of those teams. I, I, I see Kansas beating Providence. Providence is a good team. But I just see Kansas, you know, they are a team that's perennial in the Elite Eight, like in Final Four. They're that team. So I think they're going to win there. And then you have a 10 versus 11, which is an unusual yeah, suspect coming in here. Yeah, this does not happen here. often. And you know what, though? I'm going to say it. Miami. Miami's going to, once again, pull some magic out because they're not necessarily known for being the best basketball team. But I think they're going to go in the Elite Eight. And then I just think Kansas is going to go to the Final Four just because it's Kansas. Yeah, I'm going to say Kansas and and Miami as well. But then, listen, Cinderella's going to end there. It's going to be Kansas in the Final Four just because, hey, listen, Kansas is just that good. I'm going to say this. Iowa State, if I heard correctly, only won two games last year. Something like that, yeah. And now look at them in the Sweet 16. Look at me now. Look at me now. So that said, I think they got one more game left in them. I think they upset Miami. And then they got I mean, faced. They're really an upset, though, 10 and 11. Well, you yeah. know what? But they're not supposed to be here. I mean, technically, they're playing <laughs> with house team. money. Yeah. Neither team. They're but both... Miami, Miami has had a respectable basketball program for a while. Like I said, you're coming off a two win season the year prior? Like, Fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. So, so I'll go with that sense. But the dreams get crushed then with Kansas because it's Kansas. Yeah. And Kansas is built for this. I'd love to see Ohio or Iowa State run with this. I would to see you get to the Final Four. But I, it, I think it doesn't matter because I think Villanova is going to take the side of the bracket. And then it sets up for the matchup with Duke. Yeah, I, I was, I'm going to agree with you. Like going forward, because uh, I know I won't be here next week, so I'm just going to say it. I, I think Villanova is going to the finals. Right. I, I think they're one of the most – I'd be surprised. If Villanova leaves, that is that right there is one of the biggest upsets because they have been the hottest team coming in and they have been the hottest team going through. I don't think – and, and they, are, they are one of the most dominant basketball teams in college sports, in college basketball particularly, I should say, mm-hmm. and have been for quite some time. I mean, some years they take off, but, you know, they've been there. Once again, going with the storybook – them versus Duke in the finals. Yeah. yeah. Villanova's an old program. Duke's an old program. We've seen this in the tournament before. I mean, once again, if Duke, I'm going to pick Duke to make it to the finals. I'm going with the storybook ending. I think Duke's going to win it all. That's that's just my opinion. Uh, once again, if the storybook could end with a nightmare, though, UNC could end up in or Villanova could win in the finals. How, how bad would it be? If it comes down the last second, Villanova drains a three to win by one, and Duke loses the tournament. Would not be the first time yeah, they've done say, that. Right, right but I'm, they they did that. I'm just saying, could you the imagine? The worst deja vu experience Could you possible. imagine Coach K's last game? They're up by they're up by two going in, three seconds left. It looks like Duke is going to write the storybook. It's just pass. The guy goes to pick it off. He misses completely. Wide open three. Drains it. And that's it. One point victory, Villanova. No. That would make people. There would be people crying. No, you know there'd be people. There'd only be one scenario worse if they reenact Christian Leitner over Kentucky. No time left. Oh, Inbound Lord. turnaround throw. You know what? Even be worse if Duke uh, pulls the Chris Webber baby, oh. calls the timeout oh, no. to lose the game. Oh no! <laughs> that happens on my loser phone because I don't get on Twitter. Oh, no. 
The possibilities are endless. I mean, that's the beauty of the Final Four. Everybody's got a shot. Everybody's got a chance to do this. Well, and this tournament has just been so absolutely fucking insane. Like, I got a notification from ESPN that they had 17.3 million brackets entered on their website. And after one day, one day of the first round, there were only 173 brackets left perfect. And then within a few games of finishing on the second day, they were down to two. And by the end of the second day of the first round, so we didn't even make it out of the first goddamn round, ESPN had no brackets left perfect, which is so unheard of. I don't remember firm numbers, but I remember a couple of years making it to at least the at this point, you know, with like the Sweet 16 Elite Eight, there's still a couple hundred left. Maybe maybe a handful, less than a hundred left, but two days and they're all fucking broken? Jesus. Yeah. It's a wild scenario, but that's why we come to watch the tournament. It it's, makes it what it is. It's what makes it exciting. It's the it's the fact that you don't have to be the best team. And that that sounds bad to say, but you really don't have to be the best team. You just have to be the best team that night. Exactly. So a lot of predictions going into the Sweet 16 weekend. So hit us up on the hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. What is your thoughts about the bracket moving forward? How is your team doing and who you got winning it all? Let's talk about it, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is Tom from Tom Joe Lou. This is Matt from Sideroom Sounds. And you're listening to ODPH Podcast. Wanna go where no one knows my name To the desert, the oceans, or the plains Cause I wanna... Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast with Rich from 3FN in the house. Pad, what you got? Got to talk a little local minute because looking at the Binghamton Black Bear schedule from this past week, uh, they lost their game on Friday to the Danbury Hat Tricks by the final score of eight to five. Uh, they won their home game on Saturday, uh, March nineteenth, uh, against Danbury by the final score of four to three. And then Sunday they played the Delaware Thunder, where they lost by the final score of six to five. Uh, looking ahead to their schedule this coming week, they've got a game Friday on the road in Carolina playing the Thunderbirds. Uh, that is at 7.35 p.m. Eastern. They've got another uh, game in Carolina on Saturday. This is at 6.05 Eastern. And then they close out the weekend again in Carolina, that time at 4.05 Eastern. Uh, they return home, however, on Friday, April 1st. That is at 7 o'clock Eastern playing the Columbus River Dragons. Uh, more information and all that good stuff, uh, BinghamtonBlackBears.com. Uh, switching over to some baseball stuff, uh, had some breaking news as we were discussing the show. Uh, nothing huge. It was just some uh, rule changes uh, for this upcoming baseball season. Uh, this according to Joel Sherman of the New York Post. Uh, the roster has been expanded to 28 men uh, through May 1st. That's since they're going to be doing fucking nine-inning doubleheaders for the entirety of that just to make up time or whatever the fuck they're doing. Uh, the automatic runner on second base is going to be in effect for this year uh, in extra innings. Uh, and obviously with the universal DH taking place this year, uh, the pitcher can remain DH after being pulled from the mound, AKA the Shohei Otani rule because Shohei Otani likes to bat when he pitches, despite the fact that there was no technically no pitcher hitting in the American league, but it's hypothetical if Shohei Otani or some other pitcher decides to bat in the American league, uh, and they get shellacked and they get pulled after two outs in the first inning, they still hit as your designated hitter. Uh, so that hmm. uh, makes, makes some sense. I'll, you know, we'll see. Uh, and then just some uh, deals that were announced uh, since we uh, were on last week. Uh, former Cy Young pitcher Zach Greinke agreed to a one-year deal with the Kansas City Royals, so he's going back to where his career began. Interesting. How yeah. much are they paying him? Uh, it doesn't say. Uh, it okay. It doesn't say. Uh, the Chicago Cubs landed Japanese star Seiya Suzuki. Uh, he's agreed to a five-year, $85 million contract. He's an outfielder. Uh, it's already been confirmed he will be wearing the number 27. Uh, and when asked why he chose the number 27, he said, quote, I like Mike Trout. Oh, makes sense. Works for me. Uh, the Philadelphia Phil Phillies added uh, free agent outfielder Kyle Schwarber. Uh, so he's heading to Philly. So Philly's definitely loading up. Yo. Uh, the Oakland Athletics traded away another all-star, uh, sending third baseman Matt Chapman to the Toronto Blue Jays for minor league prospects. Uh, listen, folks, if you follow baseball enough, you can kind of tell, I think, what the Oakland Athletics are trying to do. And let's get out of their stadium in the worst way possible. Oh, they're trying to go to Las Vegas. Yeah. Uh-huh. They're, they're trying they're, to follow the Raiders to Las Vegas. Yeah, they're they're putting a real shitty product on the field so that they it gives them an out. It's real slimy, but uh, we'll see. Baseball. Baseball. Uh, this was in a surprise move. Chris Bryant signed a seven-year 
182 million dollar contract with the Colorado Rockies. Damn, I that blows my mind because they let go of their all star there. Yes, they I, did. I'm blanking on his name. Nolan. Uh, or, or Arenado is gone, but that also Trevor Story is gone as well. Yeah. So the fact that you're dumping all that money to get Brian, uh, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Uh, and then in one of the more uh, in, interesting moves, I think that's been going on in baseball. Freddie Freeman is going to the LA Dodgers for a six year, hundred and sixty two million dollar <sighs> deal. That offense is fucking loaded and scary. Uh, the Padres uh, traded with the New York Yankees for uh, the Padres received Luke Voigt. Uh, and in return, the Yankees received right-handed pitcher Justin Lange, I believe is how you say the name. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it makes all the sense. makes sense. Once the Yankees signed Anthony Rizzo. Matter of time. You know, mat- it was a matter of time. Writing was on the wall. Uh, the Atlanta Braves signed longtime Dodgers closer Ken- Kenley Jansen to a one-year $16 million deal. That should be great for them. Uh, Phillies also landed on outfielder Nick Castellano- Castellanos. Uh, the Marlins signed in a World Series hero uh, Jorge Soler, so he's uh, taking his talents to South Beach from Atlanta. Uh, you also had a hey, former Yankees pitcher, former Seattle pitcher Michael Pineda signed with Detroit. Uh, Carlos Correa was the other one, and fucking hell, this contract. Signed with the Minnesota Twins, of all people, so now we understand why the Twins were offloading Josh Donaldson money and all the other money, was so they could afford this shit. The, uh, Carlos Correa agreed with the Minnesota Twins on a three-year $105.3 million contract uh, gives an opt-out after the first two seasons. So regardless, the man's going to be making $50 million a year. Minnesota paid that? Uh-huh. The Twins? Yes. Wow. Yeah. I Congratulations, Minnesota. You got a fairly decent shortstop, although congratulations on getting him a one-month early start on his vacation than he's used to. Uh, and that's especially if the Twins meet the Yankees in the playoffs. Yeah. Just saying. Wow. Uh, and then also you had the Red Sox, as I mentioned, land Trevor Story, another highly sought-after shortstop. They landed him for a six-year, $140 million deal. That one fucking hurts. Because Trevor Story, I know, wanted to come to the Yankees for a while, seemed like they were out, and then once the Correa deal got done, he was thinking, oh, maybe the Yankees will give Correa, uh, Story a similar deal, and he's going to Beantown. Yay. Thoughts on that, Rich? I mean, I'm kind of used to the, the, the Red Sox trying to swoop in and steal shit. I mean, that's what they do. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't quite worry me. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. The, the Story deal, I understand. But if you, if you really want to come to the Yankees, come to the Yankees. Like, that's the whole thing. If you yeah. really wanted to, the thing about it is, like, I touched upon, like, with Zach Greinke, and I saw he had one quote, i paraphrase a little bit, he, when he uh, left Kansas City the first time, and he signed with Arizona, I believe. Yes. And they go, why'd you sign there? They gave me the most money. Oh, not yeah. wrong. Yeah. Listen, you go with, I mean, I'm gonna, I'll defend anybody who goes somewhere that's giving them the most <laughs> money. That's just smart business. But on, on top of that, you got to remember, you know, there's that old saying, everybody wants to play for the Yankees. And it, the difference of it is, is yeah, there's a lot of people who want to play for the Yankees. But in Major League Baseball, if you really want to play for the Yankees and you're a good player, you're going you're gonna to be there. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna make sure you get there. If not, it is what it is. I mean, it's not like football where you have to. You know, a lot of times guys don't ever end up playing for their favorite team because you know with salary caps and such, it's a little harder to make you know the. Uh, ends me you know me especially if you're a good enough player that you're commanding a lot of money uh so you know the Devonte adams of the world who get to play for their favorite uh football team don't usually happen but in baseball it normally happens unless your name was manny ramirez who never made it in the pins hey. hey thank god only if he did though i, I uh, mean, how, how, how different the world would be i mean if the original trade would have gone through with texas which would have sent a rod to boston manny ramirez was part of that trade so he would have been in pinstripes. Oh, yeah. And the Red Sox would have never won the 2004 uh, World Series. Uh, they'd probably still... Oh, that's, assuming there's not a, there's, that's assuming there's not a stolen base on second there. Right, right. But I'm just saying, if, yeah. you, if you think about it, all the pieces that ended up giving them that, getting the win in 2004, most of those pieces were coming to the Yankees. True. It was six players True. for A-Rod. True. But then they were like, well, we can't afford that. So basically the league... Uh, I always love defending that because it's like the league... The Texas put themselves in a, in a position where they were going to go bankrupt if they didn't get rid of A-Rod. And so basically it was like, well, who can afford them? Well, the Yankees. And the Yankees made a deal with our enemies, if you will, to just be like, okay, we'll pass them through. We'll take some of the money off the plate, and you give us all these prospects. And then they were like, well, we can't afford all that. So, like, not the players, yeah, but yeah, the, yeah. the salary. And so it was like, okay, I guess we get saddled with this son of a bitch. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, I was not happy with A-Rod ever, including when he had those years where he had video game numbers, because I just never liked him. 
greatest just... walk-up music of all time. This is why I'm hot by Mims. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm hot. This is why I'm hot. Facts. The most booed man in Yankee uh, Stadium history. Number 13. That's how we refer to him as. <laughs> Rich, what you got for rounding the bases here? Oh, man. I'm going to talk some wrestling. 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 There it is. I knew it was coming. Uh, so, uh, we, you know, obviously 607 TWS every week is a nice uh, place where myself and Ken M uh, go ahead and uh, dissect everything, uh, the, all the smaller stuff. Over here, you usually talk most of the WWE and AEW stuff. But if you want to check me and Ken M out. We're live on Twitch every Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, twitch.tv slash 607 podcast. Of course, podcast form 607 podcast. So we're not going to talk about any of the GCW stuff and everything. We have a huge week coming up for 607 TWS where we'll be breaking down the collective this upcoming week. We'll also be breaking down WrestleMania, Ring of Honor card. Uh, Everybody's wrestling on WrestleMania weekend, let's be honest. But we got some rumor mill going on about WrestleMania and for once, not involving Cody Rhodes. Ooh. So it has been reported that Omos was going to have a big match at WrestleMania, one of the nights of WrestleMania. Okay. And so a lot of people were speculating. But it seems to be that a certain superstar who was out injured will be making his return at Mania and is believed that Bobby Lashley will be taking on Omos I'm cool at WrestleMania. That. They are not announcing the match wow. until the night. They're leaving it as a surprise. But I'm glad that Bobby Lashley is going to be able to make it to the big show. And I hope he doesn't lose. That's some, that's some insane recovery. Holy shit! It's an insane recovery. Uh, it's a big, po- you know. Well, he's a freak. Yeah, like, he's a he's a freak athlete. I'm sure that uh, he's been. I, I'm sure he wanted to be on WrestleMania more than anything. Oh, I, absolutely. I think if there was a, a a physical chance he could do it. He's pushing himself to do it, and that's a huge move for all of us too. Like for anyone yeah. that's not sold on what he is, I mean, he's, he's good. Going to be a superstar. He's good. And I also want to take a brief uh, second because we did not address this last night. Uh, but I want to take when we did six or seventeen hours. But I want to take a quick second to talk about WrestleMania for a second. There is this weird movement on the internet and it's not by wwe fans or just casual wrestling fans because as you know i don't watch any of the wwe product right yeah. uh, I, I keep my eye on it to know what's going on obviously i'm going to watch wrestlemania because that's something that's been part of my life my whole life and also wrestlemania usually delivers there's a few instances where it hasn't yeah uh number nine <laughs> number nine number 28 uh there's a, there's a few others but with that being said uh, there's this weird uh, movement going on. And like I said, I've noticed it's not necessarily from WWE fans or casual fans. It's mostly with the people with the All Elite in their name. Uh, and uh, it's about WrestleMania going back to one night. They're ripping fans off for two nights. Ladies and gentlemen, they're not ripping anybody off for two nights. First of all, I was at the last WrestleMania. There was one night. There was th- WrestleMania 35 at uh, the wonderful, beautiful MetLife Stadium in uh, East Rutherford, New Jersey. Uh-huh. Uh, it was about uh, it was a balmy 50 degrees, and when the sun set, it got down to the 40s somewhere. And it was eight hours long. I mean, Christ, I mean, Christ even Uncle Dave has said that they're not going back to, no. for the, to one and night. Now, he said, barring something changing or something weird happening, even Uncle Dave has said, no, nah, it's going to be two nights going forward. No, I agree. But here's the thing. and I'm going to address these fans, but when it was eight hours long, I showed up at MetLife at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and I didn't leave until after midnight. That is a long time mm-hmm. to be in a stadium. And that's not even accounting for traffic back to your hotel, oh, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is fucking obnoxious at any stadium. So with that being said, never again. And I think whatever it is. So here's the thing. WWE has done the smart thing and moved to two nights. I don't understand where this gets to ripping off fans. Fans are more than happy to pay to get to WrestleMania and see it two nights. I would rather a four to five hour event over two days. So that's still eight or 10 hours yeah. over a one day, eight to 10 hour event. Here's the other thing. There is, unless you live in some real far off place where internet's not good, you get WrestleMania for $4.99 on the Peacock. Yep. Yep. You're not paying AEW $50 a month pay-per-views or what WrestleMania used to cost you $65. So how is that time consuming for you? If you don't want to watch it, just don't watch it. Well, if they spread out this, this card looks great, but if they spread it out, they're going to have filler. Well, you know what? Sometimes that filler delivers. I don't know how many people last year thought that Bobby Lashley versus Drew McIntyre was going to be a terrible match. And guess what? It was an amazing match. And that was with a weather shortage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was with a delay on the event for the first time ever at WrestleMania. And I'm going to tell you what, I thought those two guys delivered and then some, because that's exactly what I wanted to see from those two gentlemen. And it was a great WrestleMania moment. Of course, that night also had a tremendous main event with uh, Bianca Belair realizing her dream over Sasha Banks. Well, and, even, and even sometimes you look at a match or on a card, they go, oh, that's going to be filler. I remember when I was going through watching WrestleMania 17, 
you know, consider one of the best of all time, that I'm looking at the card and there was that gimmick battle royal or whatever the hell they had. The Shiki uh, baby one, baby. Yeah. And I'm looking at that going, oh, yeah, that's, that's a filler. But I ended up being fucking really great. And I'm like, that was fun. That was awesome. It's all about how the performers do in the ring when they're given the time. And spreading it over two days is not a bad thing. No, and, and you got some fans, most fans, I would say, would probably be there both nights. But you will occasionally have those people like, all right, I can only spring for one night. Uh, let me pick the night where more of my favorite wrestlers sure. are on. Well, here's the, that's the only problem, I guess, is the live ticket. But it is what it is. The live ticket to WrestleMania always, always already costs you a lot of money. So, I mean, at that point in juncture, it's, I, in my opinion, it's a mute point. I don't think anybody's fighting for this. I think it's just a really dumb idea from people who just don't watch the product. Once again, I don't necessarily watch the weekly products either. But I would rather watch two nights of WrestleMania. Also, because I'm a New Japan fan, I have now become accustomed because they did it first to watching Wrestle Kingdom over two nights, which was a lot better. And trust me, there's filler there too, Oh yeah, but it's still great. I much prefer the two nights thing just because I remember when I started watching was WrestleMania 30, and the first one I remember being super long was the first one in Dallas. Yeah. You Ooh. know, where where that one where it went on for fucking like five hours or something, and I'm like, this is, this is fucking long. And they just kept getting longer and longer and longer, and at no point did I ever have a WrestleMania where it got super long that I'm like, oh, that was awesome. I remember getting to the end like, holy fuck, is this over yet? And then they went to two nights, and I'm like, this is fucking amazing. And I also want to point this out. The same people who are bitching about this will also bitch if somebody's not on the card. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, you're going to yeah. be like, well, so-and-so didn't even get a match. So-and-so didn't even get pushed. Oh, instead they got Logan Paul on. Why are they doing all this stuff? And they didn't even put Finn Balor on the card. But then there's two nights and Finn Balor gets on the card. And you're hey, come on, guys. You, you, you got to get just let it go. Stop being haters. Most fans, I guarantee if you poll fans, and WWE has, most fans prefer the two-night setup. And you know what you're just mad about. If you're an AEW homer, and that's fine. If you love AEW, if you're an AEW homer, you know what you're really pissed off about. You bragged about your million dollar gate at double or nothing, and they're just about to do 220,000 in two nights at a stadium. Not to mention the week after you're in Las Vegas for double or nothing, they're at Allegiant Stadium, 80,000 people, probably going to sell out whatever. I, I don't know if it's going to be all 80,000. I don't know if they'll cut it down like they did with the Rumble, the 60,000. I would imagine they're going to be wide open. But I'm going to throw it out there. It's going to be way more than the 12,000 people at uh, the arena you're performing. I just want to throw it out there. And I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm just saying, leave well enough alone. Watch what you love. We preach that in 607 mm. TWS all the time. And just leave it alone. Because if I have to deal with a fucking eight-hour, nine-hour WrestleMania ever again in my life, hey. I'm punching somebody. I'm, I'm dead serious. Five-hour revolution was long enough. They Ooh. were smart. They should have spread over two nights and done three-hour shows. Just putting that out there. So, listen, the more wrestling content, the better. Two nights is not much to watch. So go for it. And if you're going to be mad about it, just don't watch the program. Go you know, watch a rerun of Double or Nothing from last year. It'd be great. You know, enough said. Exactly. Enough said about that. By the way, there's enough other wrestling going on that oh, weekend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tune in. Rewatch something. Tune into something else. Trust me, you can find it. Ring of Honor is running Supercard of Honor. New Japan is running two or three shows from what I saw. Some of them are joint with other companies. The Collective is on. Uh, WrestleCon is on. And trust me, there is no shortage in uh, 607 TWS next week. That's why we're going to have a long-ass show, because there's no shortage of events that you can tune into. You can control your own narrative and watch whatever you want. Oh, Jesus. They're, oh. Ru- they're running, too, by the way. I know. Uh, oh, I know. Uh, uh, EC3 lives his gimmick. That's dude, all, all I'm going to say. By the way, uh, if you guys want to uh, you know, make it down, we'll, we'll get you some kind of thing to donate. And uh, you can donate. You can send me to the VIP so I can just talk shit to one of them for like uh, an hour, because I guess they like verbal abuse. I wonder if one of them gets off on it. I wonder if that's the real deal. Like, like it's, like, it's something, man. Like, there, like EC three is like, like he he's gonna pull. Basically, he's gonna pull Louis C.K. on you when you're in the room talking shit to him. I don't know. I saw I the know. I saw those rules, and I was like, somebody watched the movie Fight Club and took it to heart. <laughs> yeah, this is just, <laughs> we well don't, said. We don't do any of those flippy moves. No Canadian destroyers. Like, if that's in your rule set, that's kind of funny. Yeah, it's. It's a different world in, C- in uh, Control Your Narrative. And by the way, that's because none of those guys can do a Canadian Destroyer, let's be honest. Facts. So let's close the show talking some UFC, though, because they might be able to do some Canadian Destroyers there. I've seen a couple super kicks happen. Pad, this weekend, though, UFC Fight Night was in London. Yeah. And what was the big story from here? Well, so it was one of the better cards I think I've ever seen. I wasn't able to catch the prelims, but I was able to catch the main card. Uh, the card was so damn good from start to finish that Dana White decided to give every fighter who won a performance of the night bonus. So he gave nine fighters $50,000 bonuses. And I got to say, the card took place in London. 
little bit of home cooking for some of the folks who won. Uh, you had uh, Jack Shore, who is from uh, Wales, uh, got, got a win in there. He had another gentleman uh, from the United, from Scotland, mm-hmm. also in the United Kingdom, get a win there. Molly McCann, uh, we'll talk about that fight. Liverpool, got a win. Uh, Gunnar Nelson uh, from Iceland, uh, he, from Iceland, uh, got a win in there. Also, Arnold Allen from England, got a win Huge there. Huge win there. Tom Aspinall from Manchester, England, got a win. A little bit of hometown cooking. I would say hometown cooking, but they got up for the fights. I mean, Aspinall defeated Alexander Volkov in the main, and damn, that was a big move for him. That fucking arm bar. Yo. Yeah, he definitely almost ripped the whole arm off of Volkov. It was a nasty fight, but you know what? This is the thing that when you have a fighter that like Aspinall, who's definitely coming up in the rings, and we talk about the guys that are going to be the next ones yeah. for the Francis and Ganus. Yeah, Aspinall is right on the cusp, and I know he called out Tua after this or oh. Tuivasa. Yeah, who yeah, Tuivasa? You saw that after the knockout last time is now in the top five. That's a fight they're going to make. That's going to be a crazy fight, and I wouldn't doubt the winner of that gets a title shot. I mean, that's just how crazy it is. The one fighter, though, from this card that's making a lot of noise, and I know that we've kind of shown some sound clips from him uh, in our group chats, Patty Pimbleton. Uh-huh. Or Pimblet. Pimblet, yeah. This kid is going to be the next Conor McGregor in the sense of he's going to be the guy you go check out for sound clips. The guy is electric in the ring. Patty the Blatty, I believe. The, ba- the bad guy. The Batty. Yeah, Patty yep. the Batty is his nickname. Yep. Uh, so he got a very nasty rear naked choke on Vargas for the win, and definitely was celebrating. The whole crowd was absolutely electric around him. Uh And like I say, for this kid, the sky is the limit, and I could see the UFC strapping the rocket pack on Oh, it has to, just because he got into the the press conference after the fight, you know, with all the reporters, and he's walking in there in his shorts, no shirt on, fucking slice of pizza folded in half, walking in there. People are cheering for him in the fucking press conference room, chanting his name. And they go, oh, you know, start to finish. What was your reaction to that fight? And he just looks at the reporter and goes, with a mouthful of pizza, goes, that was gangster. Yeah. This kid Fucking is a real love deal. this kid. How are you feeling about Patty? I think he's I think he's phenomenal. Uh, I think that he is the uh, a younger uh, version of what Conor McGregor used to be. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Talk smack, back it up. I hope he continues on because I like that kind of fighter when they're, uh, as long as they're winning and fighting. Yes, I agree with you too. Gunnar Nelson also came back into his winning ways, and he's been around for a while. But the fight that, or the stoppage that really caught me off, like, got me out of my chair, Molly McCann. Yo, that spinning back elbow. What the fuck? Yeah, she absolutely dropped Luna Carolina, and that was a nasty knockout. Just oh, that, spinning oh, back up a spot on the chest. I did see that highlight. It's crazy. Shit. Yeah, so these fighters definitely brought in and say for the UFC that's looking to make some stars. I got to look at this card and say Uh there's a couple that I could see making a breakout sooner than later if they stay on this track. So this was a great PR night for the UFC, a lot of great action, and this is something they desperately needed. Oh, yeah. no, I mean, even though Molly McCann's knockout made enough noise, that Barstool was like, yo, we got to sign her to something. Yeah, absolutely. I think that she's going to get signed after this. Absolutely. She absolutely should. For something. So as we're winding down the show now, though, I got some breaking news, actually. Ooh. Uh-huh. Uh, from ESPN. Oh. Yeah. Adam Schefter is reporting that former Chiefs wide receiver Demarcus Robinson is signing a one year deal with the Las Vegas Raiders oh, Jesus. per his agents at Cats Brothers. Oh, Jesus. How are you feeling about that? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it, it, last season uh, for the Chiefs, he had 25 receptions, 264 yards, 10.6 average, 33 yards was his longest catch with three touchdowns. I'm not assuming the Raiders are bringing him in to be a number one. Obviously, we have the number one, but he's going to be a solid number four. Uh, receiver it looks like hey that's a solid pickup raiders are getting loaded man just... shots fired at the chiefs yes desperately needed to do so, so you know, obviously let them know if you if you thought last season was a fluke it's definitely not so look at that right under the wire they got us one more free agency yeah in there. can't go wrong with that so rich since we're closing out the show why don't you tell the people <coughs> about three fat nerds 8122 productions let them know where to find you oh absolutely of course if uh you would like to drop by and uh Go into our sense of humor and movie reviews and all the nonsense that is pop culture and nerd about the Three Fat Nerds podcast. You can find us anywhere you get great podcasts by searching Three Fat Nerds. Of course, that's the number three, not the word three. That's for everything I'm going to say here. Uh, We're on all the social media platforms. Three Fat Nerds pod. Throw an at in front of it if you have to. You can find us there. Make sure you're following us. Uh, Best place to get all the information, though, 
Productions.com. From the website, you find out all about the Three Fatners podcast. Horror Zone 607, which I co-host. Yes. Uh, our last episode is out right now. Anywhere you get great podcasts by searching Horror Zone 607. We reviewed the movie X and also bring you the biggest horror movie and horror overall news. We talk everything horror there. Of course, also 607 TWS, which I mentioned earlier. Twitch.tv slash Horror Zone podcast. Myself, Ken M., we're doing big things over there. Uh, the numbers are going up, man. The numbers on the booming. podcast side have been going up and booming. The numbers on Twitch and the replays especially are booming. Uh, you know, we wish we could build that uh, live one up, but that's okay. I'm liking I'm liking where everything's going. It's all trending up, and uh, we're there for it. we got a couple big, big weeks coming up on 607 TWS. Next week, we are previewing everything that is WrestleMania weekend, including the collective Ring of Honor, uh, Super the, the, the uh, New Japan shows that are going down. Of course, WrestleMania is... Itself. I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about that. And then the following week, we're going to have a little WrestleMania hangover. We're going to give you our reviews for WrestleMania, for The Collective, for Ring of Honor, all the cards going down. And we're also going to be joined by a very cool guest who uh, is going to be doing big things in the wrestling business in the future. Of course, that is Super B. Brandon Sevilla will be in studio on April 4th to go over all those great things. And also, he's going to be talking about uh, the next event that he's been he's going to be doing, which is the Excite event going on that, that upcoming weekend after that. Mm-hmm. Uh, with that being said, also, you know, like I said, you can find the T Public store if you'd like to buy some swag. As Ken M mentioned, there's a big sale going on, I guess. So go in there. You can get some Horror Zone swag, 3 Fat Nerd swag, 607 TWS swag. Uh, you know, more to come soon, so keep your eyes peeled on that as well and of course uh if you would like to also support us monetarily and help support everything that goes on with the streaming podcasting and all that crazy stuff you can uh go ahead and join the patreon patreon.com slash 8122 productions little as one dollar a month you get a ton of extra bonus content and uh we try you know as fat guys we try to overcompensate but there's some really cool stuff going down over there on patreon and uh you know hey come on join of course uh, you never know ken m drops in on that patreon feed sometime as well this is true wrestling by every now and so, then. so we have some we say we have some fun over there so uh support us out and like i said all that information is on 8122productions.com and you can also find the link to it at odphpodcast.com because they're right on the friends of the show page so you go under the classifieds you click on friends of the show boom they're right there how easy is that but also while you're at the website you can check out all the music that you hear on the whole 607 podcast family like brian wolf will be closing the show out tonight you can also check out parley points which has the comics blogs the wrestling blogs which is a companion piece to this podcast and 607 tws which the the views on that are coming back huge too by the way so if you're not sure about like all our wrestling talk i mean we could do the whole self brag that both 607 tws odph are in the top 100 of apple podcast wrestlings uh charts just kind of putting that out there you know we're doing big things top 100 125 so it's a big movement going on right now so if you like that wrestling coverage that's where you go to but you get to it from odphpodcast.com because it has everything that is the odph and 607 podcast right there including that t public store biggest sale on record that i can remember going on this week so we'll definitely be posting about that too so definitely keep your eyes out and go get some gear go get some swag go get some stickers go get some mugs there's a ton of great stuff to go get support your favorite indie podcast of course, it's support 607 Podcast as well. Rich, thank you as always for swinging by, brother. Oh, I'm happy to do it. I love talking football. I mean, that's why I come in here to do it every so often. And uh, I couldn't wait to talk about this week with all the happenings. So th- this is definitely the most exciting off season I can remember in quite some time. I mean, I know some teams aren't doing a ton, but some teams don't have to do a ton. But, I mean, have we seen this many stars move and re-sign for big bucks like this no. in a long while? I mean, no. It's crazy, crazy amount. And there's still people out there. Like, this isn't over yet. It's crazy, oh, that's the man. wildest I mean, thing. I mean, there's still some really big names out there, so there's still more to come, and I can't wait for the NFL season. I'm uh, I'm going to be waiting <laughs> for the baseball season as well. Uh, but, you know, obviously with a little late start here, uh, I'm not too excited. Yeah. And as yeah. a Yankees fan, we, we don't have much to be uh, over the moon about it right now. No, <laughs> but... But it is what it is, and I'm sure that I'll work out. And, uh, you know, I'm a Lakers fan, so bas- basketball season's over. And <laughs> like, we, got, we got hockey. We got hockey. Hockey, Hockey's coming. Actually, hockey just uh, had a good trade deadline as well. Nothing uh, huge, like I said earlier. But uh, Yeah, the, the Rangers did moves, but nothing really super crazy, I don't think. UFC's killing it. Like, come on, man. We're, we're, we're in a good spot. Wrestling's killing it. We're coming in the biggest wrestling. Whether you love WWE, hate WWE, we all know WrestleMania weekend is the biggest wrestling weekend on the planet. We're coming into that so we're going we're going strong uh gcw just announced they're going back to new york city i sent you the link earlier yeah that's crazy so uh, i i do believe that was june 18th mm-hmm. they're returned to new york city not the hammer sign at the melrose ballroom but still 
that's an amazing thing. So hopefully I'm going to go to that. There's so much cool stuff going on. There's no reason to be mad about anything. Just watch the cool stuff. And, of course, March Madness. Come on, man. It can't get more exciting than that. Absolutely. For the one and only Pat J. Fuck the Astros. All day, every day. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening to the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. See you next time. Cause they can't bring me down if I'm already under the ground I'm gonna try to make them laugh I'm gonna try to make them laugh Cause the laughing man's got nothing to say about me They're judging only by what they can see This behavior goes way back Oh